All right. Welcome back to Hello, everyone. Let's Read Sar uh, Sacred and Terrible Air. Uh, we are going to be picking back up where we left off, which is uh, at Chapter 7. And uh, a couple things of note. Uh, since last time, the uh, Disco Elysium music has been flagged, so we've had to replace it with... Uh, not Disco Elysium music, so that's what you're going to be hearing. Uh, I think it's tonally appropriate, and I think it's going to match the energy we're going for. It's just not going to be the, the tracks we recognize, but I hope you guys don't mind. Um, I got some stuff that I think will be okay, and uh, we'll just kind of feel it out. Um, Sounds yeah. like a plan. DMCA, what are you going to do? Uh, that being said, again... You know, the, the tone is, is all right. And, and I don't mind that much considering that this is literally not Disco Elysium, you know. So it, it is okay for it to have that uh, be its a, a different thing. Um, yep. Yeah, so uh, another thing too as well. So uh, yeah, content warning, of course, uh, just like last time, uh, this contains references to sexual assault, like horrible uh bad things there are definitely uh subject matter that get as dark as possible just like disco elysium does it gives you its warning up front and uh i'm doing the same here because it goes places as far as we've seen so uh, uh of the first couple chapters um and the tone is not always gonna gonna be the the, the one that you kind of remember with uh, 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 Harry and Kim kind of yucking it up. There's definitely a, a darker tone to this, so fair heads up about that. Uh, speaking of uh, fucked up subject matter, the um, previous version we went through as well, like, uh, so thanks to Josh's uh, uh, reader, we're able to go through this and experience it with the whole UI you're seeing that's very Disco Elysium-like, and Part of that as well has been the ability to kind of cover um, things that would, that would possibly be TOS violations and or slurs and things that are uh, uh, you know, not great for broadcast. Uh, however, it was a bit uh, uh, aggressive last time and we were missing some context uh, to some of the chapters, particularly the Vidkind Herd chapter and uh, Zaum. Like, there were a couple things that I... Uh, I th we were not fully like because of the way it was it was uh, blocked out it wasn't you weren't you weren't aware of what the word was even supposed to be necessarily so we've changed it a little bit so now at the very least in some cases there will be uh you know the letter for context and in other cases i've pulled it back so that we could see what's going on and we'll we'll just judge accordingly so um just giving a heads up about that and yeah uh when we last left off, the short summary in the first six chapters has been uh, that a long time ago, uh, some 20 years ago, uh, four girls disappeared and no one knows what happened to them. It became a uh, large media story, but ultimately the mystery remained. And uh, over the course of these chapters, we met uh, a group of friends who grew up with those uh, four small girls and became adults and are now trying to solve the mystery of what happened to them on their own. In the process, we've also learned about some uh, aspects of the world, including um, the process of getting shoved in a memory hole, getting things, thoughts deleted from the, the, the public space. Um, and we visited a child rapist asshole piece of shit a horrible character named Vidkenherd, uh super Nazi type who uh, then was pretty much murdered by one of the main characters and it was uh, very graphic and uh, that's more or less where we left off and he felt that he solved the case so, yeah. That's about right. Yeah, now we're getting back into it. I think that's about right. All right. 
Chapter 7. The world is going wrong. Time is disjointed. Inayat Khan turns restlessly in his bed, located below ground level, under a cellar window. Outside, it was getting dark, and the pale light of street lamps seeped into the room. The cellar was filled with old junk, as if frozen in place, with dust particles sparkling in the grayish light coming through the window. Underneath draperies on the tables, there were dark shapes of evaporated memorabilia. The frames of pictures on the walls formed dark squares with their shadows falling on the floor and fading away in the center of the cellar. There was a dedicate, excuse me, in the center of the cellar, there was a delicately shining glass case calling out for attention. Tiny objects were waiting on many shelves. Wake up, dear collector. How long will you sleep? We know you're not sleeping. Khan's fingers fumble around the headboard. Without any serious effort, he overturns things and looks for the button on the tape recorder. Suddenly, it seems more pleasant to curl up under the blanket instead. Pedestrian shoes are clicking on the wet pavement outside as they return from work, and Khan makes a desperate effort to get a little more sleep. Ah, come on, says his exciting toys. Let us listen to your fun wake-up song. Khan's atrophied heart muscle begins to throb slightly from the little effort, and there's no more sleep. His hand reaches for the headboard, his finger moving over the ivory keys of the tape recorder. Underneath the draperies, the objects are held in suspense, and then there's a click, and before the gentle arpeggios of a guitar and the soft sound of an old electric organ, the tape hisses, empty for a few bars. It's been a long long, long time. How could I ever have lost you? A loud thumping drum beat with bass comes in from the left channel. When I loved you. In pajama pants, Khan rises into a sitting position to the sound of rolling drums. Pushing aside the snake skins of the sheets, the man puts his feet into his sharp tipped slippers. His unshaven chin shakes in one last yawn until he opens up his big almond eyes wide and puts on his glasses. Khan ruffles his hair and begins to sing along lazily. He has a beautiful voice. It took a long, long, long time. Now I'm so happy I found you. Hairy belly hanging slightly over his pajama bottoms, he plays the next part on his personal air drums. How I love you. And presses switch with presses the switch with his foot. The old bulb flicks on and off, in sync with the drum beat. The filament buzzes for a moment and then goes out. A dodecahedron autographed by the unknown dodecaphonic composer Comte de Perus Maitresi sinks from back sinks back from the golden light into the darkness. When the bulbs light up again, the title on the back of the book, Los Desperadisos, Les Los Desperacidos, emerges from the dimness. So many tears, I was searching. So many tears, I was waiting. This part is catchy. Singing loudly, unashamedly, Khan moves through the basement like a performer. A row of ceiling lights reveals the carefully arranged stuff on the tables. Wooden file drawers rise in alphabetical order. On the wall is a portrait of Nadia Harnaker in an oval medallion, a map of the desert of Erg, with Ramon Karzai's supposed routes to the dunes to plead an audience with God and pins mark the places where he might have found his mysterious end on this journey. As he passes, Khan pulls the draperies from the board and puzzles after puzzles unfold before him. Twelve miniature golden and green ships with Saracit dragon carvings, barely the size of a thumbnail lined up. Rows of oars in dark blue fake sea with white wavy crests. The papyrus yellow sails of the little ships are proudly lowered. 
Men in reed armor stand on board, pennants flapping on their spears. It's the Gonzu expedition of a thousand men. At the behest of the Safra Emperor, they set sail from the coast of Samara eastwards, more than 3,000 years ago. They're searching for peaches that can make the Emperor immortal, never to return. Two and a half millennia later, later signs of their settlement are found to the east, in the Anise Islands. The Gonsu exp expedition could not return. Their Emperor was cruel and fierce, a tyrant. There are no peaches that can make one immortal. All these beloved objects, trinkets, things left behind, somehow touch Khan. And how it sing, how it stings. How odd. He's never fully understood what it is. And yet a smile appears on Khan's mouth, a smile of a fat cat who's getting its chin scratched. Above the desk, on the sand, on the stand, under the light of a green desk lamp. is all about the girls. Newspaper clippings, scattered notes, there in the middle, copies of Mellon's letters. The handwriting analysis is extraordinarily 95% accurate. The letters arrived a year and a half after the last day in Charlottesville. To the girls' parents, everything is fine. We're with a man, says someone who says she's Mellon. We love you. Khan puts the coffee pot on the burner, and the song turns soft and quiet. Like in the beginning, it's his favorite part in the whole world. He could listen to it forever. He shakes his head with a bitter smile and puts his hands over his heart. I think there's going to be references musically with the Justin Timberlake last time and the DMX and in Disco Elysium mm. that uh, if you catch it, you catch it. If you don't, we're just going to have to read it out. Yeah. Bear with me. <laughs> if you if you recognize it and I don't. I can try to point it out or something. Yeah. Go for it, please. Now I can see you, feel you. How did I ever misplace you? Outside, you can hear the wheels turning as the machine stops in front of the house. It starts to drizzle and raindrops can be seen on the basement window. The tape recorder makes a click and the song ends. There's a calendar on the door where no one has bothered to turn the page for two months. It's still August and under the 28th, it's written, International Day of the Missing. It's the 28th of August, just in their honor. That's the day. Ini, your friend Jesper is here. Brush your teeth first, Khan's mother shouts from the kitchen upstairs. The man pulls his top-stitched dressing gown and makes his way up to the basement stairs. In the middle of the room, in a glass case, stands Harnanker. Two years ago, the crystal goblets are ringing. Saturday night bustle in the Telefunken Tower restaurant. Behind the panoramic windows, Vasa spreads out, a slim ghost. Darkness, slow and lights, snow and lights. The prices are expensive here, but not like tastelessly expensive. This is not the way. The clientele has too much social nerve for that. The food is five star, but the company, higher class, look. There's the president of the communications department with his wife and the CEO of the Freibank, Freibank with the charming singer Pernilia Lundqvist and a Vesper businessman having dinner. The charming singer is eating a salad with olives while the CEO recommends crawfish to a Vesper business partner. It's a delicious here. You have to try it. And to him there, next to the bearded professor, isn't he Conrad Gessel, four-time Oscar Zorn nominee? A very intelligent man. The CEO of Freibank, Freibank is, of course, wearing P black out of his mind. And look, there's 30-year-old, there's a 30-year-old loser. The loser lives in his mother's basement. The loser's wearing the same light blue shirt he graduated from primary school in. 
We hate you, loser. Who let him in? It's so sad to watch. He's probably on a date. So pathetic. That woman hasn't said a word to him for 10 minutes. Listen to that silence. I'd hang myself. How about if I give him some money? Just a little bit, like 10 real. Maybe he'd feel better? Disgusting loser. Don't give him anything. I hate him. He certainly can't pay his bill. He certainly won't. Hysterical laughter. That wine alone is 40 real. <laughs> I hate you, loser. Die. I hate you so terribly. Khan is sweating again and tries to cover his ears with his hands, shaking his head, blinking his eyes, anything to end this barrage of humiliation, until suddenly, silence. A brunette woman, with a sharp face sitting opposite him, twiddles the wine with a wine glass. The boredom is suffocating. The woman glances at the panoramic ceiling, at the dark brown, beautifully shaped, under her arms. Then, suddenly, a flash of inspiration. It's a beautiful place. There's a new design here, I think. I remember the last time I was here, everything was completely different. Khan's face lights up. Y yeah, yeah, my friend made it. He likes this kind of stuff. Minimal and clean. I haven't quite figured out exactly what was up with it now, but I think he's kind of invented it. He's quite famous. De la Gardie? Jesper. Yes. You know him? He's so talented. Oh, of course. Jesper and I have been friends for a long time, before he became famous. To be perfectly honest, Khan smiles nervously, I don't think I would have got reservations here if, well... Ah, I was wondering. What were you wondering? Khan asks, but the brunette woman doesn't answer. It's silent again. Khan glances across the floor at the guests, who, for a moment don't seem to look back at him in contempt. Back at Conrad Gessel's table, he sees a woman introducing a skinny man with blonde hair to the documentary filmmaker. The waiter, too, notices presence and rushes to serve the gentleman a regular. Ice water with a slice of lime. In a dark gray waist cut suit and lime wedge between his teeth, the gentleman looks very young and somehow elegantly sleepless. The chic way he shows off his plain t-shirt under his jacket is unmistakable. He can afford it. His shirt has the iconic album cover of a famous dance artist. Jesper! Khan exclaims inappropriately loud across the tables. His date flinches a little and then looks questioningly towards Gessel and Jesper's table. There he is, Khan says cheerfully, as if relieved to the brunette across the table. He stands up so that his friend can better see where Khan is. Jesper, hey! Like this, with sweaty stains on his armpit, on the armpits of his frilled suit, he stands in the middle of Telefunken's panoramic restaurant and watches as Jesper furrows his eyebrows in annoyance, spreading his arm in the direction of Conrad Gessel. He pretends not to know him. Ow! It's a hot Saturday afternoon, 18 years ago. And a rosehip brush... A, a rosehip bush has scratched Annie's leg under her torn, under her short skirt. The girl steps angrily out of the bushes and Jesper, the doctor, trots to her side. What happened? Let me see. Annie lifts her skirt just a bit and then gives up. Ah, it's nothing. Silly bushes. Ooh. She stops halfway through the word and her mouth looks like that vowel. So beautiful. Beautiful, says little Jesper, still seeing Annie's leg in his mind. The pleated edge of her tennis skirt curling up. Khan pushes the bushes aside, and Charlotte and Mil Melin step onto the edge of the cliff, mouths agape. Really, I can see why you're loitering here all the time. Such a nice wind. The breeze blows Charlotte's auburn hair in her face. The girl squints her eyes, pushes her hair carelessly aside, and goes, hmm. The wind tears pe white petals into the air. It seems as if little Maj in a winged dress, is floating above the rustling brushes. She draws shapes in the air with a fairy godmother's wand and feels like the most important person in the world. She's on Teresa's... Sh Excuse me. Let me get this pronunciation correct. <laughs> oh, okay, got notes. She's on 
Teresh shoulders, who doesn't care one bit about the thorns of rose hips. He wades through them and sets Maj down on the grass. Teresh is scratched up and smiling stupidly. The salty breeze dies down. The air is redolent with syrupy scent of flowers. Insects buzz. The seven of them barely fit on the lawn of the boys' hideaway. And that was the plan. Anyway, Jesper is content. The boys couldn't sleep all night. Grinning, making plans for the next day, sneaking around. You can say that mood flew. Teresh was against coming to the rock because of the long journey and thorns. Jesper, along with Khan, found that it was still the best place. And it was. The girls are impressed by the view. Khan introduces the cl classification, power to go through the pale. Excuse me. Khan introduces the classification, power to go through the pale, and capacity of the Grad Antique Cruiser glimmering on the horizon. Looks like Malin hasn't started yawning yet. And the best thing, it's windy, but the weather is so warm that Annie still wants to sunbathe. Malin unwraps her beach towel and ends up next to Khan with Maj, who's waddling along. Khan is straining his memory, but unfortunately, he can't say anything. More interesting about antique airships. Let Teresh and Jesper carry the conversation. He lies on his back and closes his eyes. The orange shimmer of the sun, the sounds of water, the clattering of tools, all cooling down quietly, and in the boys' popular science stream, it's space autumn up, up above in orbit, and the vibration, as always, it's starting to get chilly. The faceless, bottomless, epiphyseal membrane spreads beyond the giant ridges. Forgotten in the sky, these ancient communication satellites calibrate their rusty bellies towards the curvature of the Earth. Articulated joints of catapults shift position. Boulders screech at the edge of the stratosphere like a flock of cranes, and communication units crackle onto the ether. A cluster of measuring devices compound, compound eyes look down where the southern coast of Catla Isola blooms briefly in a summer gust. Like a beautiful dream, a landmass dozes in the cool cradle of thousand kilometer maps and cyclodial eddies. It's the past, approaching, all consuming. The pale is all around, but the dark green forests of matter and the white shoreline, the shimmering sun mirror of the North Sea, the Vasa archipelago, and the small Charlotte's Shawl still hold on. And the less matter remains, the smaller the area you compress it into, the more strangely it sparkles. Seven of them lie half circle on a green patch on the rocky peak, with the waves crashing below. Up above, there's a cotton ball-like cloud from a castle in the air, and the cloud's cities reflect on Khan's curved glasses. He opens his eyes. Charlotte's Lund, entirely made of scented matter, pulls her summer dress over her head with one swoop. Her rounded curves and smooth sun-kissed skin come into view. Teresh feels her slender joints. It grazes him. It's hot. Annie is embarrassed about her birthmarks and lies on her back with sunglasses as a headband. Jesper doesn't dare say anything about it, even though he really wants to see them. And Malin, modestly, unties the bow on her dress belt to feel the wind blowing in from underneath her skirt. The dress fabric flutters like a sail. Cider, announces Teresh, bearing his upper body. And indeed, from the depths of his backpack emerges a three-liter container acquired through an unprecedentedly complex operation last night. Drops of water sparkle on the glass. The hermetic cap hisses open, and a small, vaporous stream of carbon dioxide rises from the bottle's mouth. The apple cider foams and bubbles, the froth accumulating around the bubbles. The girl's mouths water, but little Maj looks confused and sips her lemonade with bits of lemon floating in it. Teresh carefully places the cold bottle against Charlotte's hot check cheek. His father will find out next weekend that the cider is gone, just when he wants to offer it to the gallery owners and curators at the Cultural Cooperation Garden Party. But Teresh doesn't care. Look how beautiful she is. Charlotte. And how happy it makes her. 
and his father is just an academic capitulator, a model koiko, and a bootlicker of usurpers. Frantisek the Brave would not think highly of him. Why are you so quiet? asks Malin softly, so the others won't hear, and rolls over towards Khan. Annie's ears perk up. Strange that you should say that, little sock, she teases. Ah, be quiet, laughs Malin with a soft, warm chuckle that Khan can feel against his ear. Speak. You always have such cool presentations. In history and natural science. Khan jumps up from his school desk and triumphantly pumps his fist in the air. Yeah, yeah. That peach story was so sweet. Annie, don't interrupt, Franz Malin. Wait, what peach story? Tell us, Khan, it's really loud. That Ilmara, the fleet and the emperor... Finally, Khan opens his mouth. Wrong Isola, dude. Samara. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean it like that. You know, in a racist way. Very funny, Jesper. Anyway. Now Khan turns... Now Khan also turns a little towards Malin. Cautious, cautiously, to not touch her. You were sick then. I remember. Khan remembers very well. He wanted to postpone the presentation so that the performance would not be wasted, but the teacher did not understand the subtleties of the situation. In Samara, more precisely in Safra, there is such mythology where peaches play an important role. If the if the Ani, if the Anais Islands if the Anis Islands have cherries, uh, then they have peaches. They grow there wild. You can pick peaches from the forest. Apricots, peaches, and nectarines all come from Samara. Even now, a lot of fruit is brought t to us from the SRV through the pale. Malin nods dutifully. Yes, long, long ago, when Katla wasn't even populated yet, the Emperor of Safra sent his most famous explorer, Gonzu, to bring back peaches that would make him immortal. Twenty years later, the city of Vasa is blue. The ornate lanterns on the Konigsmalm's rush hour street gleam. The dark gray dome of the sky and the northern clad crowd pass under it like a migration of ghosts from a fairy tale. Teresh's head is spinning. He hasn't had a smoke in so long. His head is thick and throbbing, nicotine pressing on his eyes, sounds fading, becoming muffled. He sits down on the steps in front of the police station, his coat tail underneath him, a slight drizzle moistens his sleepy face. Five minutes ago, clothes were thrown in his face and he was let go. The last remnants of the dream still linger. They echo in his mind, a monster sliding on the lapping waterline, right beneath his waking consciousness, giving him a throbbing headache. Danger, he usually answers. He is made of violence, but sometimes he is the man. He bends the road ship bushes and looks at them on the rocky peak. He's always there, wanting to tear them apart, but waiting patiently. In the pine forest where he puffed cigarettes, Teresh sees him sneaking from behind one tree trunk to another. He crouches on the edge of Khan's binoculars, down on the beach, holding little Maj, who falls asleep, and the doors of the horse-drawn horse -drawn tram close. He's swallowed bottomless, nothing stands under him, and everything can collapse on him at any moment. A few days left, for the rest of his life is coming soon, false and terrible. Then, when they go into the water on the last night on the, be on the secret beach for the girls, he comes to their sheets and sniffs their things. The man chews on meat, a meat pie in oil batter and watches him through the sun blinds. Teresh is Agnetha, an ice cream shop worker, and the man has a new face every time he passes by the window. From the corner of his eye, he wears Vidkundhurd like a costume, an adult Khan whom Therese now fears for some reason. And sometimes he's Therese's father. Therese feels ashamed later in the day when he sees his friend there, but there's nothing he can do about it. Slowly, timidly, he makes his way through the crowd, Fearing bumping into someone, angering someone, 
people in dark clothing flow through the streets and a large intersection and at a large intersection the traffic light glows uh glow and motorized rickshaws come to a stop smoke rises from their exhaust pipes and engines throb at the crossroads of beltways he sways along with the crowd and above him dimly lit neon lights shine and a giant lingerie model smiles high on the department store wall. The lights of a row of taxi phones. When Trish steps into the cab, it starts to rain outside for real. The cab windows are wet and somewhere in Wittgenhood's memories or in his own prison dream. Trish is not sure. A monster squats above them and pulls the torn bodies of the girls back together. Into a chimera. You know, the sleet sizzles under the taxi wheel, and the granite rubble rattles. Khan looks out the window. There's one thing I didn't tell you before about me. The car stops in front of his door in Salem. A brunette woman is holding a handbag in her lap. The man opens up the door on his side. This doesn't usually come up. It just doesn't. But you could know that this is about me. That actually, he steps out and leans into the cabin. I'm the world's leading expert on disappearing. Khan slams the taxi door shut, takes three steps over the pedestrian road to the external stairs, inserts the key and enters the hallway of the wooden house. The sound of a motor can be heard from the outside and the machine starts. It's dim and warm inside. Potatoes are boiling in the kitchen. Mom, it was terrible. Khan picks up the phone. The device hangs on the wall and the numbers are on the keypad in the wallpaper. Absolutely terrible. Don't even ask. His yellow fingers jump on the keys. A 16-digit series of interisolar interisolar connection at the expense of the responder. Mr. Ambart Sumian, I was given your number from an auction. Mr. Ambart Sumian is not available right now, the male secretary's voice replies quietly from a distance. No, you don't understand. I'm calling about Harnaker. Harnanker. I was supposed to receive my airship manual. This is very important. Sorry, can you hear me? The line crackles, and the call is fading into the pale. The noise of time. Two years later. Have you heard anything from Tarish? Jasper asks as soon as he enters Khan's hallway. The sweet smell of poverty wafts into his nose. What is it? Cinnamon? Stale bread? No, I haven't heard anything. I actually wanted to ask you about it. This whole thing, I have to say, it worries me. Khan leads Jesper, his bathrobe fluttering straight down to the cellar. Close, he points to the nail above the stairs. Jesper feels uncomfortable. That same strange smell, just like before. He dislikes it. He'd rather live on the street. He'd rather burn all this rubbish down and put up with that smell, than put up with that smell. Above all, he fears that Khan's poor old mother will jump out from somewhere at any moment. But Khan insisted unyieldingly. We'll do it at his place. He can't be bothered to come to the city. We'll do it at his place or not at all. Jesper, with his past mistakes, had no room to argue. With a heavy heart, he descends the last step into the cellar. But then the boy in him takes over. Wow! Yep, not too shabby, you'd say. I would say. Jesper's big head spins on his neck. Oh, he exclaims. Gonzu. He taps on the little man standing at the bow of the first ship in the Safra fleet with his index finger. Tiny Gonzu, barely the size of a fingertip and with a long drooping mustache. Mustaches like Samara's dragons. Dragon. Held. Let me try that again. Excuse me. Tiny Gonzu barely the size of a fingertip and with long drooping mustaches like Samara's dragon holds a pennant with the emperor's coat of arms in the man's other hand is the compass the size of a pinhead a gadget that he claims to have invented himself I put this together a year ago remember last time I only had the ships ready still unpainted and I think if I press, there we go. 
So oh, this wow. is from the book. Oh, beautiful. Inside the glass case. That's awesome. Nice paint job. It reminds me of like when you go into the uh, the secondhand shop and it's like there's all these little figurines and collectibles and it's like oh yeah like Robert is probably a fan of little toys mm -hmm. <laughs> knickknacks. Mm -hmm. Khan stands proudly in the middle of the room. Wait, what's that? Jasper points to the shiny showcase behind him. That, that's my crown jewel. That's my precious. Jesper, that's the Harnanker. The original? Jesper approaches the showcase reverentially. Of course not. Don't be naive. It costs more than you. Khan laughs with professional superiority. It's a copy, one of two existing. The fragile silhouette of Harnanker spreads out behind the glass panel of the showcase. Jesper strokes the glass, which is taller than him, and looks for the switch to turn on the lights. Look there, under the base, a big switch. Jesper clicks on the lights, and it's not the showcase, but the brilliant light of the antique airship itself, with its ten floors that switches on. The model hangs in the middle of the showcase, suspended in the air by invisible wires, like a silver varnished wooden swan. On the first deck class, on the first class deck, behind crystal glass walls, small chandeliers glitter through the four-story hall. Tiny people are frozen, trying to come down from the spiral stairs. It seems so light, fragile. Silver arches stretch like sails on the ship's hull and coverage at the bow as the nickel-plated coat of arms swan of the Cest Empress. It's amazing, isn't it? That they thought of something like this. They thought something like this could pass through the pale. Look, here are the blankets. Here there are blankets. Khan is so happy that he can finally show it to someone. Blankets! These little baskets here have outdoor blankets. Ridiculous stuff. Sitting right in the pail. With your girl. Honestly, I could stare at it all day. I understand how. It's not, well, it's not too shabby. Jesper, Jesper circles around the display case and stares and shares his discoveries with Khan as if he hasn't been staring at it every day. For the next, for the past two years, sitting in an armchair next to the model. Sit there. It has particularly good view. It has a particularly good view. He points to the, the chair. Jesper has no time to sit in the chair. Wait, the propellers, do they? Now go back to that switch. Push it up one more notch. Khan says with a sly, cunning smile. Jesper puts his hand on his forehead, and his mouth falls open. The swan's large silver propellers, sharp as knives, six of them for maneuvering on the sides under the ship, pointed towards the ground at different angles, and two even larger ones at the stern, start rotating slowly, and then with an increasingly loud hum. The individual blades disappear, leaving, o leaving only the glowing, hazy discs. The propellers are so large and dynamically directed that Jesper has the impression that the ship is about to take off from the display case and fly away, disappearing from the room and from history. The hull of the ship bears the beautiful inscription, Harnanker, in the Grad script. Jesper unscrews the cap of his water bottle, and Khan makes himself coffee. They sit at the edge of the display case in armchairs. Looking at the ship, the interior designer now feels the same foolish hope that Khan can sometimes infect him with. Still wearing his morning robe and pajama pants, that lazy cat sips his hot coffee, and Jesper looks at him in surprise. It's seven o'clock. Tell me you weren't asleep? A little depressing, I know. That's what it is. Jesper laughs a dark laugh and then stares at Harnanker for a long time. I wonder why he didn't call. Tadesh, right away. I've been fidgeting for two nights. It's getting on my nerves. I'm not fidgeting. I'm just like this, with a nocturnal lifestyle all the time. Kind of an artist type, Khan smiles. Maybe he found out something from Herd that started right away. So you don't think Herd himself might have done something? done something Pfft, hardly fantasy you can't imagine how much those guys can lie i did 10 i did a hundred thousand i did more than erno pasternak 
They have everything in numbers and fame. But that drawing was... One-on-one, I know. Exactly. Something should come out of it. Something, yeah. Jesper gets up and takes his bag from the coat hanger. But I don't think Teresh is fishing somewhere. As far as I know, we have, you know, an agreement. That when it comes to girls, we do it together. That's right, agrees Khan. But out of the corner of his eye, he still peers at Harnankur with a mysterious absent-mindedness until a soft black parcel lands on his lap. See? One, uh, female acquaintance brought it for me. She must have thought I'd gained weight or something. Should be fine for you. Khan puts out a brand new Perseus black dress skirt, a shirt from the package labeled PB. Thanks, man. He's sincerely grateful. You can throw that rag with frills away now. Tadesh's potato-colored Koiko hair is wet from the rain and appears almost black. Excuse me, do you happen to have change for 10 real? He crouches down behind the entire kiosk counter in his long coat. The teenage girl chews gum indifferently. No, we don't. Very well, then I'll have the cheapest thing you have. A box of matches, for example. And please give me some coins in return. Sorry, sir. We don't sell matches. Nothing is more unpleasant than a whining teenage girl. The girl stretches the toothpaste blue gum between her mouth and fingers. Damn it. How about Astra? What? Astra? What's that? A lollipop? Give me that lollipop there, now! A raspberry-flavored lollipop with caramel swirls clicks against... Mahayek's crooked teeth. He piles coins clattering into the payphone. The cabin has sweet smell has a sweet smell of rain. It's nice to watch how the water droplets flow down from the glass. Teresh likes the cabin. The lollipop is good too. Good thing there were no matches. The phone pressed between his shoulder and the ear and his ear and ear. He turns the numbers. His head is cleared up a lot. The caramel is sweet and the raspberry is sour. Just like raspberries are. Damn, Jesper is never home. On the table, under the phone, the notebook with the, coll- with the collaboration police emblem is open for the phone numbers. Teresh's wet fingers leave stains on it. KK Kabroleva Khan. The wheel rattles again outside the glass. Dozens and dozens of people come out from the department store and go in. Freybanks Sea Eagle glides over the bank sign, steaming the golden, steaming and golden from the rain. Hello, I'd like to speak to Inayat Khan. Is this you, Teresh? Khan's mother worried, worried voice. Khan's mother's worried voice crackles in the receiver. Yes, ma'am. Is not Inayat home? Listen, Teresh, you listen to me. Don't start tormenting yourself with that again. You know. I saw the girl's mother one day. Yes, of course. Listen, ma'am. We happened to talk a little bit. Yeah, in one ear and out the other. Khan's mother talk. Khan's mother's talk is a mood killer. Ma'am, please tell Anayat that I'll call. It's urgent. Sorry. Mom, who's there? Khan stout. Khan shout echoes from afar. Is it Tadash? No, it's Pernilla Lundquist. One of your many admirers, the older lady says sarcastically. Footsteps are heard running down the cellar stairs and cars zoom past. A splash of water against the phone booth door. Tadesh! Hi, Khan. Listen, where's Jesper? We're in a hurry. Here, Jesper's voice responds from afar. Me, here, Jesper. There's nothing more enjoyable than hearing the lively voices of your friends while hungover from Za'um. Listen, you need to get to Lovisa quickly. Nursing home, skimming. Look somewhere, I don't know, in the phone book. Visiting hours, end at 8 o'clock. Okay, skimning, what's there? Derek Trentmolier. And, you know, I think 
Kexholm Circle. Today's Kexholm Circle is a horror story for women. It'd better be. It'd be better if it were. Why do you think it isn't? Jesper tries to squeeze himself between the phone. Khan, ask him why he thinks it isn't. Why do you think it isn't? Listen, we'll talk about it on site, okay? Okay, we'll take a taxi. Jesper, do you have taxi money? Yes. Okay, we'll take a taxi. What follows is just the wait and mass of time and space between places. The taxi ride, pedestrians in dark clothes, a gray sky, and puffs of smoke from the engine. Tadish Mahayek. Autumn moments like smooth traffic in a row. Yes, Khan's mother saw the girl's mother in the doctor's waiting room. So what if they're her four daughters? Who is she anyway? Lose all your children in one day. Can you imagine how that feels? But tell me, what has this woman done to find them? So what if she has found her peace? Khan's mother's voice cracked in the phone. If the girl's mother can reconcile, can't you? We can't, you see. We're Nemo tourists. We love the girls, yes, I dare say it. We love them more. Even this moment, the evening city sliding past the taxi window, where the world is going wrong and time is disjointed, is a crime. It must be rectified, solved. No peace, no truce with the Furies. And listen, traffic glides by the side window, distant trumpet calls, long notes that shift out of place, waiting, an hour, two hours, three hours, evening, the next morning, the next week, winter, spring, a year, the next year, 10, 20 years, time like crackling sounds from a cloudy day. The summer rain wants to break loose. Boys, a little Nemo tour? Why are you standing there, whining? You're such a Nemo tourist. Some are exploring the pale between the Isolas. They're called Entroponauts. And some are discovering new lands. They're explorers, but you, Nemo tourists, when the sense of normality creeps up again, leave behind the burnt shells of your present and dwell again in the days of wonder. Traveling in your memories. No truce with the Furies. No truce with the Furies. There it Drop is. Drop it. There it is. The air is heavy with the impending rain. Swallows sweep over the water, catching insects. Jesper watches approvingly. At first, only a few heavy drops fall, unnoticed. It's still so hot, the sun shining like a white blade between the clouds. And the Safar archaeologists are off to the Ennis Islands to search for traces of the Gonzu expedition. But Jesper knows what's coming. The sudden downpours always lurk in the Katla summer clouds, and Jesper knows what time to turn on the radio in the morning. Today's weather, the announcer says, it's all part of the plan. Khan shifts closer to Malin while telling a story. He can already feel the hem of her skirt tickling his shin. The others listen to Khan's story, but Jesper retrieves the beach umbrellas from the bushes. He opens the girl's umbrella, just as thunder rolls through the sunlit cloud cover. Annie lifts her head and laughs. The sun-drenched rain curtain rattles over the beach and the cliff. At Jesper's signal, two more umbrellas open. Khan opens his, without interrupting his story, and Tadesh covers both Charlotte, who listens with her chin in her hand, and the, and the showy little Maj. Maj has braided her grown-out boyish hair into small tuft ponytails. The maneuver is executed brilliantly. The knights just smirk at the girl's laughter. So warm, feel it. Annie sticks her hand out from under the umbrella into the rain. Her back arches in the front in front of Jesper. The boys, the boy murmurs something in response and gazes spellbound at the birthmark bird path on Annie's arched back. His hands want to reach out and count the stars. The dusty smell of rain permeates the deep, permeates deep into his nostrils. How long is the memory's exposure time? Oh, 
Annie extends her neck and shakes her head in the rain. You're so different when you're not at school. Aha, nods Malin in agreement. Prepared. Kind of like older, would you say? Tanish raises an eyebrow inquiringly at Charlotte. Hey, I saw you once in line for lunch. The girl chuckles and chews on a straw in a glass of sparkling apple cider. I really couldn't say. But back then, Teresh was still a boy, Jesper teases. Now, though, a man. Malin is getting closer. Under the third umbrella, there's enough room for the girl to curl up. The golden wreath of hair falls to Khan's knees, and rain patters on the beach umbrella. The girl tucks her head down and looks up at Khan, long and foreign, with shimmering dark green eyes. Khan swallows. Malin is the only girl who doesn't want cider. How does the story end? Her voice comes from some unfamiliar place. Why didn't they come back? Well, that's the question, Khan coughs. Why didn't they come back then? Malin suddenly bursts into giggles, wicked dimples flashing in her delight. They didn't want to give their immortal peaches to the stupid emperor. Fool, Khan blurts out accidentally. There's no such thing as immortal peaches. Charlotte sits up. But maybe there is. How do you know? You think that's how it was? That Gonzu and those thousand sailors didn't dare come back? The emperor will kill them, right? But if I were Gonzu, Charlotte looks over to the little to little Maj and draws dragon whiskers with her fingers. And I found immortal peaches? I wouldn't tell anyone. I'd share them secretly, only with my best friends. And then we'd travel the world together for a thousand years and see what wonders people come up with. Would you give me immortal peaches too, Lotte? Little Maj looks up at her older sister. Of course. When you grow up, I'll give you some. Why do I have to grow up? So you can be a young lady forever. Not like a little beetle, Charlotte teases. Not. Tadesh shakes her head and watches as terrible Charlotte's hair brushes her shoulder like a paintbrush, chin proudly raised. Not as pretty. Khan and Jesper, startled by Teresh's sudden change of strategy, don't know what to say. Charlotte exhales, and her chest slowly deflates. Capillary bursts on her cheeks. Teresh stares at her. But me? Could I also get your immortal peaches? We'll see. The girl grins and gathers herself. But first, you should bring me something. Just tell me what. Khan sees Malin secretly exchanging glances and the girls with the girls out of the corner of his eye. Something's happening. And he pulls up her tennis skirt over her tanned legs. Next time it's our turn, isn't it? And our place. Don't think we have we don't have our own secret spot. Her eyes flash at Jesper. What are you guys doing on Saturday? The boys aren't doing anything on Saturday. Absolutely nothing. Let me check my calendar. Nothing! We're going to the countryside for a week. Gardening. Annie's back arches. She rises on tiptoes and slips the waist of her skirt over her rear. But we could meet up at the beach on Saturday evening. Sure thing. No. Sure thing. Absolutely. The boys mutter in unison. Charlotte's purse jingles. The girl's gazes reflect back and forth between the boys like trigonometry. The rain stops, but a few drops still sparkle. The bright sun emerges from behind the cloud, and the goddess from ninth grade stretches in its rays, placing her hands over Maj's ears and squinting at the boys. This is our half. Bring cherry speed. What? Jesper is dumbfounded, mouth agape. Cherry speed. Annie enunciates. Her red tongue torches the roof of her mouth at the D sound. It's like amphetamine, Charlotte speaks matter-of-factly. Her breasts rise and fall as she breathes while speaking. Just, you know, special. It's really good. And we want to do it with you guys. Silence. Rain-soaked rose hips steam in the sun. A sea eagle hovers in the sky. Maj is staying home, right? Teresh is still thinking of those funny braids sticking up from her head. Khan and Jesper see him smoking his Astra next to Charlotte. Of course, silly. 
Davai, then, he shouts. Let's get it done. Malin smiles, infinite joy reflected in her eyes, facing Khan. As befits a teacher's daughter, she starts giving instructions. Ziggy's number is in the wallet. Call him then, okay? He'll have it. Ooh, that was a big one. Mm-hmm. The girls want a party. Yeah. I think, uh, <laughs> like, I'm, tr- I'm, I'm trying, something I'm, I'm getting a feel for is like every time it goes back to the memory of them, it's so like obsessed with their bodies and their skirts and their legs and all those things that it's like, is it the is it the boys view narration being like yeah I think. they talk and then they look and then they talk and they look and then you're getting the narration of hormones as if it was another character in their yeah. heads it feels like it you know boys you know it, it talk, definitely talk, talk, does. talk impress the girl talk, yeah talk, talk impress the girl. every time it's good. like yo check out them gams yo check out the shirt yo oh my god her hair mm-hmm. this that and it's so obsessed with that that camera point of view that it's like that would be one of the you know uh, 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 uh yeah puberty as one of the voices in your head <laughs> you know kicking in uh electrochemistry sure yeah it definitely feels that like like that because it comes back so often all right chapter eight linoleum salesman the no- the linoleum salesman travels from town to town in Norkoping, he sold linoleum along the banks of a large frozen river. Small wooden churches and narrow streets, the linoleum salesman admired the wooden architecture and the frozen silence of the north. By nine o'clock at night, the streets were empty and the wind blew through the city. The wind blew, coattails flapping, and the thick snow fell on the roofs of the houses. Snow fell in the linoleum salesman's heart rows of orange street lights what images flickered in his mind that evening in his rented room under a blanket what stories what patience in the neighbor's garden the linoleum salesman admired two brothers faces like gears mouths pursed and cheeks red from the cold and in arda at the beginning of the mountains where the fjords cut into the valleys between the peaks houses the color of red clay at the foot of the snowy of a snowy giant and at night when the window panes blinked in the dark like small eyes and the mountains blackened teeth were bared to the sky but their smiles were nothing compared to the linoleum salesman's smile he practiced lowered his chin like a caterpillar raising his upper lip the man in the hotel room mirror became schly what if he were to enter like this into a low ceiling concrete walled basement what would it be like to see something like that look now beauty look at me now then when the linoleum factory closed down times became hard but l- the linoleum salesman got back on his feet he made new contacts and met importers a new linoleum factory opened and wherever he went whatever he looked at he always wanted to see more he sold linoleum but thought of himself as a day photographer for him the world has preserved its hidden landscapes and beauty furnaces that no other person can see like a child with a kaleidoscope he dismantled the shapes in grad above the winter's orbit the linoleum salesman was selling linoleum the magnet train was ravaging was excuse me raging on the northern plateau outside the windows it was dark and the or- the aurora was above the plain in the toilet of the restaurant car the dark mountain tunnel swaddled swallowed the train and then when the linoleum salesman came out his hands were full of broken glass where did the charming flower mandala go it beckons hidden it is interesting but then disappoints with its ugly structure a show-off the linoleum salesman lost his patience his greedy nerves were raging jelinka in polarisol a man rubbed snow on his face but the snow only melted from his hot nerves 
Now he rests, trying to take care of himself. He works selling linoleum to construction stores, interior design offices, and retailers. Brown linoleum, linoleum with flowers. He comes down from the north to Vasa. In Kexholm, selling linoleum in the elite garden suburb of Lovisa, he sees something new, something he thought he would never see. He sees other linoleum salesmen, only they're not really linoleum salesmen. In the gay park on a mattress, he talks to the ticket inspector about Vasa, the feeling of safety, schools, and liberal education. The Aspen Grove rustles, and the rest too. They have new ideas and knowledge. They tell each other stories, their stories. The garden equipment renter, the foot doctor. Briefing. Therese looks, Therese looks up, looks at the silver watch that his colleagues from the missing persons department gave him for his 10th anniversary. Five minutes. He marches through the retirement home park with Khan and Jesper, the folds of his coat fluttering. Okay, okay, briefing. Khan falls behind the others. I'm in pain. I need to rest. Jesper hurries. Listen, you have a serious heart problem. I think we all agree. You should see a doctor. I agree, Therese agrees. The white window frames of the houses glow in the dim light behind the fence. The leaves rustle under Jesper's suede shoes. He looks at the mud splatters on the shoe tip and then shrugs. The sweet smell of decay. He is nervous about waiting. Your local authority could be more accommodating. Agent Bahayek continues. The collaboration initiative and the international sentiment were lacking. Khan tries to keep up. Did you get to interrogate? I did. I did. Yesterday? No, this morning. They dragged it out. Nothing I could do. I was on the phone all day yesterday. I don't know. Like an acrobat. A hundred calls. Sorry. Tadesh is a brilliant liar. Jesper doesn't doubt for a second. Whatever. Hey, what did Hurd say? He didn't see them. Jesper notices Khan's sigh of relief and furrows his eyebrows suspiciously. He's honestly a little disappointed. All this preparation for nothing. Ah, let the funeral party begin. Wait, wait, that's not all. Tadish raises a finger. He wears black leather gloves and smiles at his gesture. Hurd was so kind and gave me a name. Derek Trentmuller. That's where he heard it from. Khan suddenly stops and looks angrily at Tarish. He just gave you that name and told you everything? Honestly? He talked? Jesper doesn't understand why Khan doubts his friend's interrogation skills. Well, you were also hammering him with questions, right? In grad style? He looks approvingly at Tarish and walks on. So, Derek, who? Trent Muller? Exactly. I checked. It all fits. They shared a cell 18 years ago. The last of Derek's sentence. He was released early. There's one more twist to this. Remind me later. Anyway, together they go. They got each other riled up with their stories. And then one day, Hurd has a really juicy one. Derek feels like he owes him. Anyway, he starts blabbing. He recognizes a guy. Wait, wait. From the uh, Kexholm circle. Come on, bullshit. Khan is unimpressed. Teresh is not bothered. The sky's from that circle. Let's assume for a moment that there's some kind of circle, right? And he's like a leader. Seriously, a bad person. And dangerous? A few years later, a few years after the girls disappear, the leader comes to Derek and starts talking about how he and his friends abducted the girls. They're lovers. By the way, the leader and Derek. Nice. And Derek can't tell anyone anything, otherwise they'll kill him. So, now Derek tells Hurd, and you can't imagine the things that, in the format of Hurd and Derek's conversation, are, uh, interesting. I also looked up Derek a bit. He, as much as I could find on the Kronstadt papers. 
a pedophile, molested his sister's children, mainly the family, nothing serious. The woman eventually turned him in. Derek is a coward, tells the pastor how much he regrets it and how it's something that pushes him. Tadesh skeptically shakes his hand, his hands, as he says this and then continues, and all the rest of the diabolical stuff that comes with it. Under the trees is the back of the nursing home. The veranda has white painted wooden edges. The stone stairs lead to the back door. Time appropriate red walls and fragile wooden architecture. Just the kind of house from Vasa's past that would remind its inhabitants of their youth. Chestnuts drop their last leaves on the roof of Skymning. Now, of course, Derek is 70 years old. Or 75, you do the math. And do you know why he was let go earlier? Khan and Jesper don't know why Derek Trentmuller, the homosexual lover of the leader of the Kexholm pedophile ring, was released from prison earlier. He became senile. What? So in his 60s or something? Jesper understands the complications that could arise. Something like that, yes. Totally senile? I don't know. It wasn't written in their how senile. Anyway, the situation deteriorated quickly. We'll see. Khan shuffles up the stairs of the retirement home after the others. The three of them stand at the front of the arched wooden door. Tadish rings the bell. Drawing, Khan pants, hands on his knees. Where did Hurd get the drawing? It's like a relic there. It goes from hand to hand. If we can find the man who had it originally, we'll have our funeral party. That I promise you. We can finally start living. Tadesh rings the bell again, and this time a little angrily. Only Heard finally put up. The leader of the Kek's home. At Khan's glance, Tadesh corrects, corrects himself. The leader of the supposed Kex home group gave it to Derek, and Derek showed it to Heard. It seems to me that Heard was just a bit cautious, curious, you know, to see what happens. Tresh smiles evilly. Vasa slumbers in the blissful peace of the fifties. Winter is ending. Icicles drip from the eaves onto the pavement, leaving holes in the ice. The days are getting longer. And somewhere far away, in the yard of a central school, Sven von Fersen is picking on an overweight immigrant. What did he think, that Malin would enjoy hearing such hurtful talk, huh? Was it really so? Teresh stands at the far end of the yard and doesn't dare to intervene. He hopes that Jesper will start to feel too much pain from watching. Reflection. The linoleum salesman walks along the suburban sidewalks, his boots stained with salt from melting snow. He hasn't slept all night. The bright light and sun reflections on the ice are hurting his eyes. His hands shake from coffee. His head is throbbing. A tense, red, pulsating relay of nerves. Thousands of images from their nighttime conversations swirl in the linoleum salesman's mind. He puts his hand in his pocket, where there's a hole cut with scissors at the bottom. He takes the horse-drawn tram in, the circle, in circles and gets off at Falu stop every time, slips under the bridge looks at the willow thicket and gets back on the train on the tram from the other side of the road the linoleum salesman's head rests against the window sometimes he falls asleep but even then his imagination keeps going taking increasingly strange poses spreading his legs before him even when he sleeps he wants but the linoleum salesman trains his nerves the tram clock strikes two outside the window, and the school day is over. The linoleum salesman draws, salesman's jaws tremble. He is awake. Children pour out of the tram cabin. In the garage at home, there are rolls of linoleum lined up. He lives here now, in Vasa, Kexholm. He walks the streets of the Lovisa suburb. The linoleum salesman hangs onto the handrail. He wants to squirm. An old lady looks at him strangely. It's the same old lady. 
She was on the tram the day before yesterday. And yesterday. He can't take it anymore. He has to choose. Falu Station comes, and the linoleum salesman gets off. He slips under the bridge and looks at his willow thicket of longings. He can't bear it anymore. Small ice mounds drip from the willow branches, and the linoleum salesman's breath warms them up. Drip. Drip. The sun sparkles on a water drop, and the visions disappear from the other side of the willow thicket. Four in a row. The smallest one talks incessantly. Blah, blah, blah. This is the most beautiful moment in the linoleum, in the linoleum salesman's life. He wants them. After that, it's over. He kills himself and frees the world from the linoleum salesman. But first, them. The smell of heart medication makes one nauseous. Jesper wipes his neck and nervously adjusts the tie in his sweater collar. He seems... It seems like all those joint ointments have somehow made it into his skin. He doesn't know why anyone would hold onto life so desperately. White lace curtains are tied on either side of the window, and something crawls onto the walls of Derek Trentmuller's room, turned into a makeshift ward. Tree branch shadows on the floral wallpaper. Occasionally, when a motorized carriage passes by with a hiss, the shadows come to life from the headlights and slide in the dim light. The table lamp is yellow. Layers of flowers and tree branches slide over each other. Death. The word that rarely appears in the boys' conversations, as if it doesn't exist. Everything just disappears and goes away. When the time comes, Jesper steps out onto the December, into the December air. The light of the cube house stays behind him. And ski trails lead to the outskirts of town. Barren fields spread under the snow, and Jesper crosses over them to where the wall trees darken, darkens. Zigzag drom. The branches of spruce brush his white coat. Dark forest, eyes green with darkness. In the cold air, girls' voices ring out like jingle bells. They're waiting, under eternal ice, in pristine environment untouched for millions of years, deep in the lungs of Grad, where no human is allowed to go. Jesper doesn't tell anyone about it. Derek's room, or rather, the ward, is cluttered with tubes. Family pictures stand in frames on small bookshelf. On a small bookshelf. Glowing glass. Jesper doesn't dare look at the photos. Children? Nieces? Will these caretakers clean here someday too? Above the bed stands a silver icon of Dolores Day. And below it sits Derek Trentmuller hands folded on his lap, a, pla a plaid bedspread on his shoulders. A tiny silver cross shines around his neck. The frame of the drip bag stands tall at the head of the bed. Boys, my memory is fading. Tomorrow, I wouldn't recognize you. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. It's like a blessing for someone like me. Some mornings I wake up and I don't even remember my own name. I don't remember who I am let alone those things. Trish's hands, Trish stands with his hands behind the curtains, examining the window frames. You seem pretty good now. He turns around. Who did you get the drawing from? Of Annie Ellen Lund's back? Who? Oh dear. Mr. Trentmuller's liver-spotted face trembles and he looks tired. I don't remember such things anymore. The things I want to remember, I don't. I don't remember my son. So then, those things... Don't fool around with me, Derek. Today she squats in front of the old man and puts his hand on his knees. Khan watches with fear as Agent Mahajek, Mahayek pierces Derek's clouded eyes. Now focus. You talked to your cellmate, Vidkund heard. You don't want to say... You don't remember Vitkund heard? Who could forget? You talked. Tadish puts his hand under the old man's chin and turns his face towards him again. Do you hear me? I know you told Vitkund heard in prison that you know someone who kidnapped four Lund girls from Charlottesville Beach 20 years ago, and you drew a sketch of one of the girl's birthmarks as proof. Derek, 
The sketch matches. Tears flow down Mr. Trent Muller's flabby cheeks. Derek, hey, the sketch matches. I did. I went to the gay park. I don't remember. I don't want to. Derek whines, his old man whine, but Teresh gets angrier and angrier. His upper lip is starting to curl around his tobacco-stained teeth. Derek pulls back as if he's seen a ghost, but Teresh's hand is on the emergency button. If you're not cooperative because of your memory sickness, then know this. We have a machine nowadays. It's like an ice cream scoop, Derek. I'll scoop out whatever I need from your brain, and then... Tarish! Khan has got up from the chair and is holding his shoulder. Then comes the blessing. Tarish, don't start with that. Jesper doesn't understand. He watches in confusion as the agent hovers over Derek, his hand on the alarm button. Khan angrily pulls him by the shoulder. You know how this will ruin you, Tarish. You know. We need you in the Copo. You must not get fired. I have ideas too. We don't need... Tadish calms down. Okay, Jesper. Get the door. Jesper peers out the empty corridor. Out into the empty corridor. The retirement home is quiet in the evening, as if abandoned. He pulls the door shut. Heart pounding in his chest, the man rests his back against the doorknob and nervously ruffles his blonde hair. The air in the room is thick and Jesper can see the old man shivering on the bed. He hides his face from Tadish with his hands. Linoleum salesman, says the collaboration police agent in a single word. The man's sad, wrinkled eyes grow wide and his eyebrows raise, rise. Who? The linoleum salesman, your boyfriend. He made the drawing. He told you about the girls. Who is he? Who, Derek? He's just... He was just... Derek doesn't cry anymore. The tears dry on his cheeks. The old man slumps under the sun as if struck by lightning. Just a linoleum salesman. They all were. That's what they called themselves. Professions. A wary sigh rolls from his mouth. Oh lord, help me. It's quiet in the room. A loose, a lone motorbike whizzes by outside, and the shadows of trees glide across Jesper, opposite the door. Khan quietly pushes Teresh aside. Very good, Derek. See how good it is now. He looks at the old man under the blanket with big almond eyes. With his big almond eyes. You're going to help us find these girls, aren't you? Two places, Teresh whispers to Khan. Two places, Derek. Tell us two places this man went, where he lived, and in which district. Do you know that? In Kexholm. They were all in Kexholm. Very good. Excellent. And now another one. Think, Derek. Think. Where else the linoleum salesman was inscribed? Help us find the girls. Where did he go? He was looking at them. On the beach. At a hotel. Have Sanglar? Therese p paces nervously under the window. I don't remember. Please. Got it. Teresh nods and takes two steps toward the door. Have Sanglar. Let's go. <sighs> 18 years ago, Vidkinthurd sits in the corner of a cubicle at, the homemade, at a homemade desk, a single strand of old-fashioned combed back hair clinging to his forehead. Now you could still say classic. Vidkind is young, relatively. The forehead is not yet covered with curls. The cheeks are just beginning to sink into a Nordic bulldog look. There are heaps of manuscripts on the desk. Philosophy of the future, historicist, eugenicist, universal theory. It explains all things in the world. It is his legacy to mankind. Vidkind Heard, Vidkind Heard, is written on the cardboard cover in bold letters. 
Two reform beds line the wall, and daylight seeps in through the s a small window in the ceiling. Derek Trentmuller lies on the bed, old, and somehow distracted. He takes the silver cross from around his neck, looks at it for a moment, and then starts to laugh. Oh, you're going to love it. I think it even has a certain superhumanity about it. Adventure and science at times. And all that, no doubt, beyond good and evil. What a spiritual honeymoon. Dedek talks and Vidkun takes notes, nods knowingly, asks to pause for a moment, then replaces the inkwell. The windows begin, the window's beam of light creeps across the floor and spreads on the steel door. It's getting dark and Vidkun lights the table lamp. He lifts a sheet of paper into the air and blows on it. Good times, good times. Dedek stretches in the middle of the room and leans closer to Vidkin. And you know what he said then? Linoleum salesman. I'll never forget it. He did brilliant surgery on them. He joined them together. The smallest one died. The others survived. You understand. Like that. Linoleum salesman. Linoleum salesman. The linoleum salesman reaches out his hand for toilet paper. The salty sea air steps into the room from the balcony of Havslanglar. And there is a telescope on the red reed mat. A special camera is connected to the telescope. Afterwards, he wanders around outside. He reads the timetable in the waiting pavilion. But the last tram has already gone towards the city. Girls on board. The summer evening is warm and makes the man's heart tender. He takes off his sandals. He walks barefoot on the warm asphalt. The asphalt is light and crumbly. The tram rails are cool. Charlotte Chow in the evening. He loves it. He loves the girls. He loves the beach where nothing means anything anymore. He is in love. It will never happen to me, he thought, as the Aurora Borealis curved over the polar ice cap. Couples under the cover of greenhouses. Snow was falling behind the glass. It never happens to linoleum salesmen, but he loves the beach and the girls, one in particular, especially that one, and others too. Sand under bare feet, between his toes, warm in the daytime, and then damp, he walks along the water's edge. Music can be heard from the garden, from the gardens and lights from the houses shine far away among the pine trees, away under the rocky cliff where no one can see. The rocks are slippery from the water, cold under his bare feet. Where did his shoes go? He doesn't remember. He walks along among the stones under the rocky cliff, waves splashing onto his trousers. Gentle darkness. He sinks, in, he sinks to his knees and laughs. The pine trees rustle, swim, he goes into the water between the rocks. No one sees how happy he is. The trousers get wet, and he slips and hits his knee. So what? The water's dark and warm, and the stars are in the sky. To Telefunken, Jesper snaps his fingers. I know people there. It's close. You can make as many calls as you want from there, Therese. Work your magic. His hand is raised, and the three of them try to hail a taxi on the only main road in Lovisa suburb. Cars was passed. On the other side of the road, a wall of, tr of trees, and traffic is sparse in the evening. It's half past nine. We'll make it. Khan follows behind. I don't know. What's the point of rushing? Let's talk. Nothing to talk about. We'll make some calls. We're flying in tonight. Besides, Jesper, Tadish is also eager. His hand is raised even for those taxis whose yellow lights are not on. What are we waiting for? Aren't you tired of waiting? Exactly. And I don't care. Jesper hops on one foot. A passing carriage splashes his clothes dirty. If you think I desperately want to know what kind of awful, ruinous, very emotional con machine you, Therese, me, let me try that again. If you think I desperately want to know what kind of awful, ruinous, very emotional con machine you, Teresh, use, then I'm not interested. 
you do your job and you don't have time. Three days are the time in which the chances of finding someone, especially a child, alive, decrease by half every day. 100, 50, 25% con. What would you do? That doesn't matter, damn it. The rain above slowly turns into late autumn sleet. A splash from under the wheel sweeps over Khan. You and your taxis. The stop is right ahead, Jesper. You don't understand. You don't understand how it affects us. Fucking mescaline. Lysergic. Here it is. Stop. Jesper runs after the taxi, stopping by the roadside and shouts back. So you'd use good cop tactics, right? Seriously, enough. Tadish grumbles in the taxi by the window. Khan slides in sideways into the passenger compartment and pants. You see, Jesper, you don't understand that this thing is illegal. In all countries that have signed the declaration, which incidentally are precisely the countries where the collaboration police have, well, authority. Tourist finishes Khan's sentence from the front and tells the driver, Telefunken. For a moment, the car is quiet. The engine starts. Sleet sizzles under the wheels. Jesper searches for an argument, but Tadisha beats him to it. Yes, I used the machine on Hurd. My decision. He would never, never have told us anything. He would have sat there. He would have smirked. He would have talked to me for two hours about crossbreeding gypsies and blacks, and that's it. But Tadish, Khan's voice, takes on a whiny tone. They'll fire you. It's under control. And you know what? I don't want to talk about it anymore. The next day, the linoleum salesman's long gaze glistens in the warm summer rain. The image shakes as he adjusts the tripod, then becomes still, sharp, clear. The sound of rain rustles in the linoleum salesman's ears. The clouds brighten in the sun, and the rain falls onto the hotel balcony. The wet edge of the beach extends over half of the reed covering, and the rain rustles down on the beach, but in his mind, he hears the joyful drumming of raindrops on the parasol. A small red-flowered parasol in the telescope's eye. It's almost like a kilometer away, on a cliff. But the linoleum salesman stretches out, stretches his hand out in the rain and touches it. Get out of the way, fat boy, he says. The linoleum salesman brought a woman's magazine from the city. On the cover was the fashionably dressed Anne Margaret Lund, a woman in politics, and there were pictures inside. Anne Margaret in her beautiful apartment. And there she was, with her four daughters on a coffee-colored couch. Under the picture were the names and ages in a row. Annie Lynn? What stories he came up with that day when he first saw them. Horrible things. How he takes them on. The linoleum salesman is a doctor. He is a doctor. Doctor linoleum salesman. And he sets them in motion like this. Walking towards him. He still couldn't get enough of it. How his nerves hummed. Hungry. They wanted to eat them alive, those nerves. And how it all receded when he came here. What a place! They chatted on two tram seats facing each other. He was behind them. And the linoleum salesman smelled the scent of their white, white hair. The tram rolled down the hill, and the horses trotted. The beach came to him, not the other way around. And the four of them led him there. Dust rose from the asphalt, reeds swayed, and the sun shone, in, shone pale in the blue sky. It was not like those other beaches, in Arda and nearby Vasa, Ostermalm, where the linoleum salesman sweated. He wriggled along, among disgusting, flabby bodies and chased after small wrinkled puppies with his eyes. This is not the Jalinka swimming pool, where the linoleum salesman's eyes were red from the chlorine and he had to wait two hours before he could get out of the pool. The wind ruffled his hair, and the vastness, the world could fit inside it. The wind blew. He took the highest hotel room so that the wind could blow in from the cool and cool down the linoleum salesman. He looked at them tenderly, not daring to go down to the beach, near them. 
he would turn to ashes if he even touched them. He took pictures. The photons traveled, and in the same light that sunburned the skins, that sunburned the girl's back, bounced off her tiny birthmarks and etched into the pitch black negative. Light dots like stars in the night sky. The shutter speed of memory. He made a linen cord and a noose and masturbated for the last time. His breath fluttered against the sheet and with the semen, the linoleum salesman came out of him and vanished. The memory of the linoleum salesman and everything the linoleum salesman saw is fading day by day. Drops drum against the umbrella and Annie reaches out her little hand into the piano tinkling of the rain. Today, when he woke up, he's no longer remembered. He no longer remembered the linoleum salesman. At the photo store, when they took the family picture, a little morsel, the linoleum salesman came to mind. And later, only more rarely, the linoleum salesman comes to his mind. Annie shakes her white head in the rain, pigtails on her back, and only he looks tenderly through the telescope. Thousands of kilometers and two months more than 20 years away, on the other side of winter's orbit, stands the meteorological research vessel Rodionov, trapped in ice. It is half past 12 on a polar night. In front of the crew, the spotlight beams out, spread out. Over the North Channel, a cold vision. Men in fur, coat, in fur coats crowd the deck, their silver gray collars lifted up to their fur hats. The crew is panicking, where the darkness seems to thicken slightly, but the distance moves on endlessly without the slightest sense of horizon. That is where the pale begins. The crew feels and fears, although no one can see beyond a hundred meters into the night. The research vessel's antenna until unit broadcasts a desperate distress signal, along with scientific readings. This radio transmission reaches the relay station in Katlagrad Oblast, distorted grotesquely, like in a curved mirror. Sector, orbit, sector. Sector, orbit, sector. There are crackling sounds as the ice edge curves into the sky under the pale. Wiping gusts like music play backwards and ten times slower. The pale approaches. An avalanche of memories of the world. And buries matter with reckless speed. The expanse of the starry sky disappears. One star at a time. Under its rolling brush. In orbit, the communication satellite ICON sees how the pale sweeps over the entire Catlin North's channel with a single wave. It also engulfs Samarskilt. The stony desert spread in the southern in southern Samara, and half the Supramundis on Mundi. The pale cycles and curves gathers in rebellion against the matter. The black holes swallow the eyes of the cycles. Azimuth calibrates at the str stratospheric edge. The immediate zones of entropic, excuse me, of entropenetic catastrophe now include Lemenskainen, Nad Umai, ecoregion in the northeast Samara Taiga, Grad Yekokata, and the network of irrigated plateau plateaus in Severnaya Zemli Zemlia. The remote, life-abandoned corners of matter. It is September 29th, the early 70s. Two nights ago was the class reunion. Now, it's the end of the world. And Teresh Mahayek, at the Telefunken Panoramic Restaurant, puts the phone on the table two hours ago and instructed the secretary of Havzanglar to read out the whole guest list for June and July of the 50... Uh, excuse me, sorry. To read out the whole guest list for June and July of the 52nd year. The table is loaded with food. The delicious crab claws are lying on the phone. Khan loves delicious crab, and Jesper explains how to suck the meat and juice out of the tube. Suck, suck, says Jesper, pointing to the waiter to take away the plates. Tonight, dinner's Jesper's way. Jesper's treat. And Jesper loves good food. He doesn't settle for rice and macaroni. 
pecan sucks. Well, I don't know. It's certainly better. But if you put dumplings in rice and macaroni... Here, let me just give it a, a switch over here. Yes, for sips ice water. Tadesh, listen. I can take Kex home myself. I've designed a pediatrician's residence there, and I know one developer. I think he should have access to what he was. The population register, says Tadesh, with his shoulders throb with pain. But the Yugograd red wine here is so good that he wants to take a sip, that he has to put the phone back on his shoulder. The secretary ended the call once already, and Tadesh called the administration and asked to pass on. The lives of four little girls will be on your conscience. That worked. Besides his wine glass, Khan holds a notebook open, and over 2,000 names are written on the pages. Halfway there, ma'am, just 2,000 more. His head throbs with Lars and Berg and Ack flashes in his eyes like train lights. Okay then. Jesper unfolds the napkin proudly and wipes his mouth. It's half past eleven. An hour ago. An hour and a half to go. Then it closes. I can bargain for two and a half. So. Let's start. I'll take the population register. The waiter puts another phone on the table. The rest of the guests watch the trio's meal with restrained interest. A thin koiko has been reading names monotonously for two hours and writing them down in a notebook. A yellow-brown overweight man in Perseus Black's double-collar shirt lifts his glasses, breaks a crab leg, a crab claw, and then waves to the aunt at the opposite table. Tadesh's notebook is messed up by that. Khan, um, you don't exactly have the hardest of tasks. Just deal with it. Tadesh, listen, for God's sake, let's take this notepad. No, it has to be in the notebook. What's with the notebook? Derek Trentmuller, says Teresh in an accustomed mechanical voice, and then looks at Khan with wide open eyes. Derek Trentmuller, hello, are you sure? Did he mark anything here? Did he mark anything there? Vacation. What else? Linoleum salesman, says the secretary, with a tired voice on the other end of the line. Derek fucking Trentmuller. June 17th to 24th. Linoleum salesman. Jesper slams his fist against the table he had designed five years ago. Khan puts the crab claw on the plate. Now comes Za'um. Derek Trentmuller dreams of a linoleum salesman. All the things that the linoleum salesman sees rotate before his eyes like a uniform mass of flesh and darkness. Occasionally he wakes up. He cannot sleep. Then the whirl of flesh and darkness returns, and Dedek falls asleep. In his dream, they are lovers with the linoleum salesman. He is someone else. Through a rising shapeless memory, a clicking is heard. The wooden window creaks. The glasses rattle in their frames. Then a thud, and Derek wakes up. Death. This must be death. Dark brown flowers on flowery wallpaper. Shadows of branches sway and curtains flutter up in the wind. Yes, this is exactly as Derek always imagined it. In front of the open window, a tall, thin figure in a fish-tailed coat appears. There are more of them. Fat death falls from the window spill from the windowsill with a thud and whispers, Okay, inside, keep watch. Tall Death comes to the edge of the bed and disconnects the alarm button. Fat Death turns on the table lamp and steps over Dedek, placing a hand gently on his hair. Those big, dark brown eyes look familiar. Dedek, don't struggle. We need something from you now. We need you to remember. And that's why we're giving you a little injection. It's not painful. It's like a dream. Dedek hears the click of a suitcase and tall death presses his gloved hand to his mouth. Strange smells, everything fades. Kind, dark, brown eyes look at him. But what if he really doesn't remember? How does it work then? We'll see. 
Derek Trentmuller opens up in front of Teresh. Now it is Teresh who is by the water's edge. The tiger wades through the water. He is always there, lurking. And wherever Dedek ends, the tiger prowls around, sniffs and finds the linoleum salesman. In Norkorping, in the Arda Fjord town, in the magnet train, in the Jelinka, in the Jelinka polar settlement, he follows, his eyes uh, phosphorescently glowing in, the, in those dark corners where the linoleum salesman goes. He is in a low ceiling, concrete walled basement when the linoleum salesman makes faces at his niece. When he finally arrives in Vasa, the tiger waits at the station, sitting at the end of the platform and licking its paws where the light of the lanterns does not reach. He rustles in the park's Ant Adler Grove and the linoleum salesman is startled. Walking on Lovisa streets on a spring morning, with a hole cut in his pocket with scissors, one can see into the tiger's heart for a moment. The schoolyard is visible and the fight between small boys. When the linoleum salesman comes to Charlotte Charlie, Teresh treads the wind there. He is a bird of prey, keeping watch. He has, to, he has eagle eyes. He sees everything. Until one evening, he sees the linoleum salesman disappear on the top floor of Havsanglar Hotel. Half of the people have gone. Day by day, it is forgotten that the linoleum salesman ever existed. Until finally, there is only senile, old Derek Trentpuller. Linoleum. Linoleum. Linoleum, he hums. Is there such a word of, as linoleum at all? A strange feeling of loss. But it is not linoleum that he longs for. The linoleum salesman mourns himself. Sometimes he remembers himself and imagines a life where he never disappeared. He spews out disgusting talk and reads Wittgenhood's memoirs, fantasies, fantasizes on his own. Derek Trentmuller longs for something completely different. It is August 29th, 20 years ago, and he feels bad. Something is wrong. He couldn't sleep all night. The morning newspaper lies on the bathroom floor. The education minister's four daughters are missing. Derek Trentmuller cannot breathe. The world is going wrong, and time is disjointed. In the light of the red light bulb, a hobby photographer reveals pictures taken on the hotel balcony. His hands tremble. He's sure they were there. Sure, but the photos on the clothesline have clothespins lined up and they have and they all have horror vacui nothingness the contours of a rocky cliff appear on the glossy paper floating in the developing tray a pale summer sky but not them khan and jesper carry the barely conscious tadish into a taxi his shoes drag along the ground and the man trembles jesper's voice comes from the convex mirror Jesper. Jesper is still a cool guy. Tadish, Tadish, stay awake. What do we do with you? He didn't do it. He didn't do it. Okay, but what do we do with you now? Take you to the hospital? Tadish. Tadish's voice is verily audible. What do we do now? I don't know. You tell me. Do we take you to the hospital or let you sleep it off? Today she tries to get his bearings. No, you don't understand. Dead end. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what to do next. Khan holds Tadish's head down as they put him in the taxi. Wait now, Tiger. You'll sleep it off first. Then it's my turn. I have a plan. Tadish faints. Everything disappears. So, uh... It seems like, uh, <laughs> I mean, there are, there, we are, we are delving into, uh, multiple horrendous characters at this point so far. And, uh, based on, uh, I want to, th I want to say, I think like, uh, the chapter five last time and now this, uh, Zaum. 
is like it seems to be a machine that rips you open you strap it uh, uh you strap people to it and via tubes and syringes and fluids and all kinds of uh horrendous fucked up things attached to you it peels you open and allows the user to experience your memories um forcefully if if need be and uh the description of Tadesh using it for the second time here like yeah it, it seems like it gives him a per- first person perspective of memories of whoever it's being used on if they exist and in a world where uh the pale builds up and where things can be erased in concept um you know you may or may not actually see a memory that has or hasn't been erased yet you know but like it, it i i'm gonna assume that it probably uses the same type of technology um and uh yeah there's not much else to say except it sounds fucking awful <laughs> you know um that's mm-hmm. that that's that's about what i can piece together about it so far and uh yeah the actual name uh from from the of the company of course translates to beyond mind i see right so whatever the implication is there um it 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 will will we'll find out more i suppose beyond mind mm-hmm new evil has showed up i mean it's being used on evil yeah but yeah on the multiple new evils but but uh, to what to what avail mm. right you know if uh if it's not who you're looking for interesting all right chapter nine: sacred and terrible smell What was that sacred and terrible, elusive smell in the air this time? My name is Ambrosius St. Miro. The locals call me Ambrosius Piramira, Pihamira, and and in Grad they call me Sviata Mira. Diduska, they ask, their eyes wide with affection. But I answer them, no, I am not your Diduska. I am Ambrosius Santa Maria, Santa Mira from Mesk. Ambrosio Hagia Mira. I am Ambrosia, the holy world. Mm, Hagi ch- might be the prefix for saint. I see. Like in hagiography, yeah. Like in? Uh, hagiography, the study of saints. I s- hagiography? Yeah. Enlighten me. Yeah, just uh, the prefix hagio. It has to has, is is the, st- to the study of saints. Yeah. Interesting. I am Ambrosia, the holy world. You chose me, authorized me with your life, your thoughts, your mind cabinet. Ah. <laughs> At night, when you went to sleep, and tomorrow morning, from the window of public transport. But what I do is no longer a, con- a conversion. Excuse me, a conversation. There are no arguments here, no sides to choose. The time for doubt is over. I come once in every era. It is great for- it is a great fortune to live when I am in the world. I am innocent, and now you are too. If you decided, then it was either right or wrong. If I decide, my decision is what is. When God still seemed like an interesting idea to you, I was pious per, perixar, pericarnassius. I was Erno Pasternak. You wanted to be betrayed and slaughtered. I made you sing Pasternakian songs. 
That's how fierce I am in my unnecessary war. You wanted to hate me then. I was Franco Negro. You were nationalists. You wanted international, black-colored banknotes and militarism. Wanted to work in the factory, serve God, and medieval industrial architecture. Wanted to live under a concrete arch. I was a woman, Dolores Day, when it seemed to you. I was, I want a mother, a perfect mother. I had beautiful breasts. I was young and so were you. You wanted to fall in love and I let you. Humanism and Renaissance care for each other. I sent you to school and taught you languages. You got tired of me and I died. You wanted a world where I didn't exist. Then I was your innocent Sola, an indifferent girl, sitting with folded hands and watching you make coups. Oh, do it yourself. Make mistakes. Don't learn anything, I thought. I was a citizen. I went from country to country, from one incel to another, and introduced you to my thoughts. Everywhere I went, I infected you with my cynicism and nihilism. On the radio, I talked about how everything is wrong, how everything is equal, and pohui. Who cares? Presidents, kings, princes, and sheiks, everyone was afraid of me. No one wanted to let me into their suzerainty. They didn't want me in their publishing houses, on the big screen, or in their talk shows. But then, when I signed the books in the bookstore, they saw. You broke down. And when I spoke on the radio, ratings went up. I was brilliantly popular. Thank you. You made me happy. They let me talk into their talk shows. And there I showed them what human thoughts are capable of. You may be right, too. And how witty you are. You kept listening and laughing. You called your whole family together uh, to gather around the radio. And together you listened, realizing how special you actually are. I could have a supermodel girlfriend, too, I said, but I have chosen solitude. That would be bourgeois, dear supermodel, of course. I could spend the entire night with you. We would have fun. You would be as high as a kite on cocaine, and I would stick a pipette full of milk up your ass and watch it squirt out. Of course, I have thought about it, but that wouldn't be me anymore. That would be against everything I believe in. But that's a show. That's not why you chose me. I was the only one who asked, what was that sacred and terrible smell in the air this time? I don't have such weaknesses, such weakness and arrogance that I would tell you what it is. I don't pretend to know what a terrible beauty is for you in your heart's secret. The end of the story, I'll show you. I want to tear the world apart layer by layer, and this time it's not a deception. A figure of speech. It's real politic. I attack. First Revachal, then Grad, then further. It never ends. I open from one front after another. I open one front after another. Then, when everyone who isn't with me is dead and the pale sweeps over the whole world, then, please, here are terminals where you can fall dead by yourself. Go on. Go of your own free will. It doesn't mean anything. I'm evacuating the world. We'll go live in the past, in front of the polycy clinic, on a park bench. You come back. You're all under the parade. The rain is pouring down, and you're talking. Your friends come across the square. In a snowy city, their collars raised. Only the memory remains of this world. An anthropogenic catastrophe. You could never quite say exactly what it is. Even when your eyes were turned inside out and staring straight into your head, you couldn't say. The ghost slipped through all the lost places. Irrevocability. I give it to you to take. It smells in the palm of your hands. The sacred and terrible smell. Rub your face against it now. The pipe is ripe with colors. It seeps from the slimy cracks. I open the rib curtains. Intermediate frequencies. And all the terrible lost colors of the past come out. Everything is new again. This is where nihilism leads. 
This is no longer what could be or what might be. This is it. The whole world is in the immediate zone of an entrepreneurial catastrophe. Chapter 10. Good night, Annie. When Jesper arrives at his suburban home, the lights are turned off. He walks around in the dark, his eyes adjusting to the furniture gradually, as the furniture gradually emerges from the darkness. He doesn't even take off his shoes. It's clean and quiet, and over half of the wide glass windows have been freshly cleaned. Someone has made Teresh's bed. The vomit bucket of a collaboration police agent is gone, and the parquet floor shines. Mud from Jesper's winter boots soak into the sheepskin rug. Bookshelves separate the sleeping area from the main room, and Jesper stops. He looks at shopping bags labeled Ozon, En Provence, and Tea Shop. There's a scent of green tea in the air. A tiny silver dress hangs on a hanger attached to the shelf. The fabric sparkles in the dark. Slipping between the curtains, the man enters the bedroom with his hands outstretched. Moonlight falls on the bed from the corner window, Jesper's model girlfriend. Anita slip, sleeps in the bed with her blonde hair spread out on a black pillow. A shadow runs along the young girl's body, which is curved with protruding ribs and a single birthmark on her chest. Jesper watches as her chest rises. He tries to remember. Four years. They've been together for four years. What is she now? 19? Jesper is 34. Psst. Hey. Wake up. The girl hums in her sleep, like a child. Jesper blows in her ear, and a blonde strand of hair trembles in his breath. Annie, wake up. It's Jesper there. Hair. Hey. Hmm. Jesper, come to bed. The girl pulls the edge of the blanket up to her chin. It's so nice and cool here. Listen, I can't. I have to go. Go where again? Wake up, let's talk for a bit. Do you want me to make you some tea or something? I brought you tea, see? The Vasa Oranje mixed race model stretches, her joints popping, and black shadows move on the surface of the blanket. Yes, I saw it. Thank you very much. It was very considerate of you. The girl begs, her drowsy vowels long like her legs. Let's talk tomorrow, Jesper. Let's go to bed. I can't tomorrow. I'm leaving. Jesper looks at the girl's face. Silence. The clock with flipping numbers rustles briefly. The wind howls outside the window. The girl suddenly snorts. Mm, don't go to the woods with your friends again. I haven't seen you at all. Let's be together tomorrow. I came for you, remember? No, you don't understand. I'm leaving today. Today? What time is it? The white clock crackles. Two in the morning. Where are you going like that? You've been acting really weird lately. The girl props herself on her elbows, her mouth drawn in a worried frown. I came here because of you. I wouldn't have come otherwise. I apologize, really. And I apologize for what I'm about to ask. But please, come out of bed for a moment. I need to move it. What do you have there? Things. The girl stands on the cold floor, rubbing one foot against the other, looking puzzled as Jesper pulls the bed. The bed legs creak. The Vasa Oranje mixed race model holding the blanket on her shoulders like a cloak. She's very beautiful, but it doesn't mean anything anymore. Where are you going? Jesper kneels and the floorboards creak in response disappearing. The trap door opens and Jesper pulls out a snow white packed suitcase. And when will you be back from disappearing? I feel like any clever answer I could give you would be too cold, so I better not say anything. The lock opens and Jesper takes a package of papers out of the suitcase pocket. The girl is annoyed. She likes those Jesper. Jesper at home, making tea. Jesper being productive. Jesper being awkward when showing his support. But she doesn't like this, Jesper. Please don't treat me like an idiot. This is not a cultural interview you're having right now. Okay, then. Jesper nervously rolls up the papers. Do you remember when I told you about the Lund girls? That I knew them? 
they disappeared, and so on. At my parents' summer cottage, the girl's eyebrows are still suspiciously furrowed, but her mouth softens at the memory. You were so drunk. See, that's why I don't drink, Jesper awkwardly laughs. But you had to beg, right? You were so funny then. So funny, Jesper bitterly remarks. Back then. Okay, I was funny. But now, I'm going to look for them. Who? Cornelius Gurdit. Who do you think? The intricate bone structure creaks from the knees of the model sink down against the wall. But you said it was pointless. You said there were, they were done with it. Maybe you don't remember what you said? Jesper, hints, Jesper hits his palm with a rolled up paper and takes a few thoughtful steps on the floor as if he needs to consult with another Jesper, one who got drunk at Anita's parents' summer cottage. A very inappropriate incident. A very inappropriate Jesper. But still, he's a thousand times smarter, a thousand times better than this helpless creature here. He tussles his blonde head with the paper roll and says, There's hope. Jesper. You see, I have to. Jesper places his real estate papers in the girl's hands. Stay here. Take my house. Live here. Please. Sell both apartments in the city center as quickly as you can. Prices will start to fall by t uh, tomorrow morning. First thing in the morning, go to my broker. Here's the number. The girl's shoulders shake, but nothing is heard. Only the wind whistles outside the window. Jesper squats down in front of his model, his winter coat hem touching the parquet floor. He puts his hand on the girl's shoulder. Hey, I'm going to make some tea now, okay? The clock ticks 2.30. The cup steam the cups steam on the floor brown sugar cubes in a square sugar bowl and a special spoon of lifting sugar cubes special spoon for lifting sugar cubes it's hard to pour but there's no fire to light either 245 i don't understand what does this mean now the girl swallows at the end of a long silence what do you think it means and all this time you had that suitcase the girl points her index finger to the center of the room. Like I didn't even exist. It was there long before you. What, I had to convince you then? Well, come on, try to understand. Try to understand? You know what I think? The model angrily puts her teacup on the floor. I think this whole thing with the Lund girls is complete nonsense. You're just a pedophile. Jesper's betrayed expression is unforgettable. The girl is even surprised by the power of her words. For that... And only for that moment, she regrets them. Okay, then. The man stands up in the middle of a sentence. He picks his suitcase and he picks up his suitcase and calmly steps out through the curtains. Then, Anita's frustration takes over again, and the naked and angry model rushes into the large room after Jesper. You can shove your cube up your ass. I'm not staying in this godforsaken Catla hole. Pieces of white paper fly out of her hand and scatter into the dark room. One by one, the pages fall onto the exceptionally beautiful, herringbone patterned wooden table and onto the parquet floor. Jesper doesn't turn around yet. He stops and tilts his head. And where do you think you're going if you're not staying here? You gonna work for the Grad Ammunition Factory? You're pathetic. You and your girls. It's just pathetic. Everyone warned me. And I already knew before the cottage too. Everyone knows. I was just 15 then. I was so stupid. Anita pants, leaning against the kitchen counter with one hand. Annie this and Annie that. My name is not Annie. Jesper feels his hands growing cold. The word morbid comes back in a whirl. He remembers himself, an underage lingerie model, cuddled up to him, saying, Good night, Annie. Good night, Annie. Good night. I'm so happy. She falls asleep. The branches of the trees rustling outside the window like a second chance. What's sad about that? It's so beautiful. The model returns to the bedroom and shouts in an inexplicable fit of malice. Good night, Annie. The human mind is naturally trusting. At first, he does not consider such a nightmare of coincidence as possible. But the more the difference between Jesper's own thoughts and the mocking voice in the room becomes apparent, the slower the man's breathing becomes, as if the body were preparing to shut down from shame. He picks up the paper from the floor, 
one page at a time, and pats the pile on his lap evenly. He chooses his last words and doesn't really know exactly who he wants to attack. The world, mostly. He walks back into the bedroom, places the papers on the bedside table, and lays out his terrible trump card. What do you think? That you're going back to Revishal? Things are not good there anymore. Come, look at it. The girl sits on the bed and angrily tries to put her evening to put on her evening dress, not yet fully understanding what the fuss is about. That city doesn't exist anymore, Jesper repeats, and now the girl stands up in alarm. What do you mean? You know, they haven't been able to make contact for five days now. I don't know. Contact with what? Revishal. Explosion. Gone. You should read more newspapers. Are you joking? Jesper, blinded by revenge, is not yet sure exactly where this lie will take him. He has an idea, but now it's too late. The girl gasps for air, her hands trembling in panic. Her nails clatter on the buttons and the radio's yellow display lights up in the dark. The dial spins under her fingers, the hiss and squeals filling the speakers as the needle slips over the shortwave frequencies. The foreign news reports speak with nervous professionalism, everything mixed up. Her cosmopolitan mind only grasps horrible fragments. Mesk aggressor, Saint Miro, Revachal, atomic weapon, and half the population. The girl shakes so intensely that Jesper begins to fear for her health. At any moment, the fragile machine will just fall apart. Finally, a voiceover announces the death toll. The girl collapses wounded when the domestic passenger list from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs scrolls through with a, particularly, a peculiarly detached announcer's voice. The famous singer, Pernilla Lundquist, recording her third studio album, Anita's big eyes are dark in the darkness, wide with terror. She screams, God, my sister, my sister is there. I'm so sorry, Jesper says. Are you sure? How can they be sure? Why aren't they doing anything? I don't know. Jesper grabs his suitcase. The girl gasps like a horse. Her mouth contorts into a huge dark scream. That mouth threatens to swallow up the world. And so it does because Jesper doesn't remember anything further. In the vacuum of the stream, of the scream, white, white snow swirls, and the room echoes from the concrete walls. Don't go. Jesper has bruises on his wrist from her nails. He closes the door behind him and stands in front of the house. It's snowing in the courtyard. It's cold and the wind is whistling. His skin is hot with steam. He grabs a handful of snow and rubs it on his face. On the edge of the courtyard, the mouth of the tunnel of fir trees, there's a black motor carriage. Teresh Mahayek steps out of the car and the glow of the salon and waves at him. Jesper, with his coat flapping in the wind and a white suitcase in hand, crosses the courtyard. The fir trees scatter, snow drifts in the distance, zigzag drom, and then suddenly the world is so light as if all meanings have been taken away from him. He is no longer worth anything. Jesper smiles. It's warm in the taxi. The machine sways as he sits across from Khan. Teresh closes the door and slides inside. How did it go? Well, let's just say it didn't go very well, answers Jesper and collects himself for a moment. Drive. The night before Monday, seven days earlier. When the city explodes in the taxi window like a disco, and Teresh trembles and loses his mind. Jasper holds him tightly. Listen, he's having seizures or something. It's bad. We have to take him to the hospital. Teresh, listen. Khan leans over his friend. We'll take you to the hospital, okay? No, Teresh grabs Khan's jacket. Please. The boys look at each other quizzically and then shrug. Teresh's face is dripping with sweat. You have to promise me. Promise me you won't turn me in. His chin trembles for a moment, and then a vacant look comes to his eyes. His body stiffens like a log. What the hell? Jesper shakes Teresh and puts his hand over his mouth. 
He's breathing, you know. I don't know. Let's let's not take him, okay? Yeah, let's not take him. To your place? Yes, precise heavily. Uh okay. It's my place then. There's just one problem. A girl from Revachal is coming here the day after tomorrow. What do you think? Will he be okay by then? Khan shakes his head grumpily. How would I know? Do you know any private doctors? Private doctor, Khan? You can't get a license if you don't work in a hospital. Yeah, well... But I thought maybe you know someone. I know one regular doctor, Khan. Will a regular do? Regular will do. Don't be angry. The taxi rushes past Vasa at night. Sometimes Teresh is linoleum salesman. Then Vidkenthood. Then Derek Trentmuller. Then Teresh Mahayek again. And sometimes he feels like he's not really there anymore. The explosion of Vasa color fills with black ink like a jellyfish. The aquarium goes dark. Teresh's suit is the blackest of the black. It's made of leaves, slush on bike tires, and the sky above the city. He straightens his cuffs and adjusts the tie knot. He's formal. He's polite. The suit smells of dry cleaning. And then, like umbrellas under the cemetery birches, a funeral party opens before him. Longed for. Feared. All are there. At the funeral, there's the mother of the girls with the black lace mourning veil and elegant wrinkles of concern beneath it. Paper manufacturer Carl Lund holds an umbrella over the woman's head. The birch leaves tremble. It's the end of the summer rains. Khan and Jesper are also at a funeral. Even Khan's mother has come. The whole class, too. They're all much older now. Teresh doesn't recognize most of them, but that must be, that must be Sixten over there, and that's little all. Von Fersen is chatting with his lackey, and Ziggy, the naughtiest boy in school, is also there, still wearing his black leather jacket. And Jesper is the only one with a white umbrella. And Teresh walks through the funeral, everyone talking quietly, patting each other on the back. As he passes by, they nod respectfully to him. And the girls are there too, under the piles of flowers, soft, fluffy soil. There are rows of toe bones, rib knobs, and clavicles like relics. Nothing is lost, everything is preserved. The records are clear as a school paper. This is the magnum opus of identification, and they will teach it at the academy. And a handful of teeth too. Majes, baby teeth, pearls from Anna's jawbone, Malin's mean, mean canines. Everything is there. Everything fits. Every little filing. The missing piece from Ali's, Annie's molar. The bike accident. And Charlotte's movie star smile. Some would have liked to take some of them from there. Just a memory. How they would clink in their hands. Those precious stones. But you mustn't do that. It would be unprofessional. A doctor comes and injects saline. Monday, night to Tuesday. Teresh gradually regains consciousness. And it's chilly. Everything at the funeral is gray and silver green. A gray tent over the black chokeberry bushes. An old-fashioned crystal on the table with fruit motifs. It's quiet. Something rustles in the bushes like a radio signal. When Teresh wakes up, he realizes what it was. News of the collapse of the northern highway has made the public space anxious, and he has no desire to play along. Teresh asks Jesper to turn on the classical radio. Classical radio, they say, plays music by dead and white-skinned men in wigs, even when the world has long ended. Perus Metrici surges. It's beautiful to listen to, like the ocean. Mm, grave. Everyone is dancing slowly, and the more Teresh thinks about it, the clearer it becomes to him that the funeral party will never come. The investigation is exhausted. By Tuesday morning, he is ready to admit to himself that they will never know what happened to the Lynn children. The high heels leave imprints on the floor of the taxi. The girl crosses her legs, coral painted toenails in a row, nude colored straps running over her Serge Van Dykes. A cluster of gemstones sparkle at the convergence point of the straps. Elegant, you'd say. If there were some vulgar crystals on department store shores, it would be a complete faux pas. But this Serge Van Dyke here, what we're looking at now, costs 10,000 real. The other one costs 500 real more. Maintenance. A single diamond jumped from the Revachal Delta to a dump. 
what's a dizzying night? What a dizzying night. Besides, Serge Van Dyke himself said that there's a difference between elegance and snobbery. And since Serge designed these shoes, draw your own conclusions. I'm going to Korsfall, 130. It's a bit outside the city, isn't it? The shoe size is 37. And what an arch! Like the arches of the West, the foot doctor at Kexholm Circle would give them a nine and a half on the scale of locking them up in the cellar. Out of ten. The suitcase phone rings, click, and the lid opens. But we're looking at those 10,000 Serge Van Dykes of how the gemstones sparkle as the foot sways to the rhythm of the taxi radio. Fucking gaff. We can't get enough of it. Hello, Berenique, darling. Ozon, so nice. I've always wanted to do something with them. No, I won't stay long. A couple weeks. The taxi door closes. The 13 centimeter heel tips, heels tip on the sidewalk. It's getting darker. Here it always gets darker, or it's dark. Where did the day go? White shins flash with a view of concrete cubes. Cube opens up in the background under the fir trees. The light, the lights are on inside. The moss sparkles, and there's a frost on the puddles before the October storms. The suitcase sinks to the ground next to the shoes in front of the door. The doorbell rings. Jesper's model girlfriend's legs seem to last forever. We crawl past them, and it seems that the edge of the bell jingling cloak will never reach us. Before the butt curve, Mask's fleet of world enders, black like a pot, appears on the horizon of Revishal. In the fashion capital, they're actually already putting their hands over their eyes at Anita's knee bending and asking, what's that ominous chimney smoke over the ocean like? Storm clouds. It's open, Jesper exclaims. The girl enters and a large room opens up before her, smelling strongly of tobacco and sweat. Jesper crosses the room for, from the window. There's a guy on the mattress, his greasy potato brown head visible from under the covers. The interior designer takes the girl's suitcase and introduces her to the sweaty, overweight guy next to him. The immigrant smiles awkwardly, and when she shakes his hand, it too is warm and sweaty. My name is Anita, the girl introduces herself. I am Inayat, but everyone calls me Khan. You can call me Khan too. And this here, he points to the pile of blankets, is my partner Tarish Mahayek. He's feeling unwell, as we can see. Khan thinks he did pretty well. It could have gone worse. What the hell? Jesper, why didn't you tell me you're dating a real model? Cool. If I had Anita Lundquist, I'd be telling everyone. Hey, give me an autograph. Hey, your sister is Pernilla Lindquist, right? Give me Pernilla Lindquist's, Pernilla's phone number and show me your boobs. Jesper, tell her to show her boobs. Khan run, ruins his jovial introduction with his laughter over the boobs. Now he's looking at them, hidden under the girl's baggy fashion outfit. Boobs, boobs, model boobs, famous models boobs, he thinks and laughs more and more. Of course, he doesn't notice when the girl asks about Tadesh for the second time. Poor thing. What's wrong with them? Food poisoning. Jesper takes the girl's arm and leads her to the bedroom to change. Khan uses tact and calls out from the doorway. Hey, okay then. See you tomorrow, right? Are you leaving already? Wait, I'll call you a taxi. You and your taxi. I'll walk instead. Goodbye, the girl calls out in a friendly voice. As Khan limps along the forest road to the bus stop, his feet crunching on the cold moss, the girl puts her pants, puts on her pants on the bed. On her loose bohemian fashion top is the face of Scherz van Dyck, in a revolutionary two-color scheme, gray and turquoise, as if stenciled. What? It's not pretentious. Van Dyck is kind of a re is a kind of revolutionary too, fashion revolutionary, the Mazov of the fashion world. Only he doesn't send the bourgeoisie to exile in the taiga of the northeast grad. He sells them, you know close. Jesper, who are they? What do you mean? You never told me about this Khan guy and the other one? Tadesh? They're old classmates from high school. We just had a reunion. Didn't I tell you about it? No. We were just reminiscing about old times. Hey, Tadesh lives in Grad. He's staying there for a few more nights, I think. You don't mind, do you? Of course not, says the girl, but she senses trouble. She stares suspiciously at Jesper's back as he goes to make tea. The reception left something to be desired. 
a measly kiss. The girl paces angrily around the bedroom, but then notices a ring box on the bedside table among the books. Oh, a surprise? Is it for tonight? The box is just far away enough that Jesper could reach it from the bed. Could it be? Don't think so. But st it's still better to know what's coming. And besides, curiosity. The mood immediately improved. A black velvet box. A tiny box. The girl opens the box. Click. Night falls over Vasa. In the city center at Konigsmalm, a fox cub runs across the intersection. Its breath colors the air blue and it tucks its ears. The street is quiet and empty. The downtown buildings with balconies standing in a row and yellow traffic lights flashing in, windows, in window mirrors. The northern metropolis at night is a light installation, a beautiful modern thing, but visitors are scarce. The Royal Architectural Museum in the Dieter Dada style looms over the river and the facade lighting makes the building glow golden. And below, in the dark, the river water drifts along, glossy like vodka taken out of the a refrigerator. Bridges curve over it, with rows of lantern pearls on their backs. A lone cyclist rides home, with the sound of the bike rattling, and the scent of farewell lingers in the air. The advertising signs in the corners of the department store go into power-saving mode with a hum. A giant lingerie model above the payphone line smiles and disappears. Anita Lundquist. Child, cover yourself, says the chairman of the Presidium. Sopramat Gnezinski. Aren't you cold? And two collaboration agents run up the stairs to the police station. Tadesh Mahayek. Where is Tadesh Mahayek? You arrested him four days ago. This man is a man from internal affairs. He's the angel of death. Tadesh who? Mahayek? The security officer waits for an answer from the machine. We haven't had anyone but here by that name. The asphalt glistens. There's a night frost and frozen puddles on the ground in Salem. Wooden houses squat on the sidewalks, and the sound of footsteps echo and the sound of footsteps echoes from the street. And somewhere inside, in the basement, an Ayat Khan toggles the lights of Harnankur. This only source of light is the airship model, which goes out every time it lights up, revealing Khan's face. The rows of lights on the ship floors are reflected in his glasses. He has an idea, a flash of inspiration, one that can only be seen when all other lights go out. Khan has been waiting for this moment for two years. He cuts the threads, takes the airship like a baby from a cradle, and dances with it in his arms. All empty display cases stand in the middle of the room. The incandescent filaments of the spotlight cool on the other side of the street. In the courtyard of the Menage, the horse trams disappear into the darkness. Horses sleep in rows in the stables. Passing through the streets of the suburb, there are white picket fences with gate latches. In the distance, the barking of dogs can be heard. Window frames gleam in the dark and wooden garden furniture stands empty on the veranda. Who rustled in the Brockthorn bushes? The night smells of frost, and the fear of future haunts the nuclear family's dreams. And where Lovisa ends, the coniferous forest begins, and Jesper de la Gardie rolls out of bed. Anita went to sleep angrily, and Jesper is worried, but not because of that. Jesper can't find his beloved scrunchie. He sneaks around in his underwear, looks on the bedside table and bookshelf, and then puts on his bathrobe and steps through the curtains into the living room. The, wall shim the end wall shimmers in the dark from the windows, and f the floor is a minefield. Milk cartons, socks, cups, cup ashtrays. A hermit crab named Teres Mahayek is settling into his new box. The agent, with his nose against the glass, wakes up. Jesper puts a cup of tea in front of him. It smells like peppermint. Hey, wake up. Let's talk a little. I don't know, chit-chat or something. Okay, but I want to smoke inside. Mouths move. Bursts of laughter are heard, and slowly but surely, the dawn starts to appear outside the window. The stockpile of cup ashtrays and cups slowly peels out of the darkness. Behind the glasses of Café Cinema, the morning light is seeping through. It's Wednesday. Early risers are bustling about on Ostermom. The street cleaning machine is humming. 
the morning newspapers are falling into rows of mailboxes. Traffic is stirring, the machine operator. Traffic is stirring. The machine operator is scraping frost from the windshield. The copywriter in his late 20s with a mustache is drinking coffee and eating scrambled eggs. Suddenly, he chokes on the coffee and runs coughing to the toilet. The morning paper is left open on the table. In the announcement section, there's a copy in Malin Lund's handwriting that reads, Everything is fine. We are with the man. And we like it here. We love you. Below the copy is Anayat Khan's contact phone number. And the text says, Good person. It's not too late yet. If you have information about this letter, if you sent this letter, or if you know anything about the disappearance of the Lin children, whatever it is, please contact us. I would like a box of Astra with menthol. No, wait. Has Radar arrived yet? No, sorry. Mr. Ulv, this evacuation stuff. No new goods are coming in at all anymore. I don't know how long I can keep the store open. Well, in that case, give me three boxes of Astra, says a curly-headed, chestnut-haired young man. The black currant wine framed there. Wine from there. How strong is it? Let's see. Let's see. The seller takes a dusty bottle from the alcohol itself. Alcohol shelf. Huh. 23%. Pure spirit, I think. Excellent. Do you have more of it? There's two here. These and the vodka. Final station. It's been aged in the pail, right? Where else? If it wasn't, I'd take it to the pail myself. It's right behind the meadow. So a pack of matches. A pack, not a box. And those candles. No more? Oh yes, I'd also like to take this wild strawberry liqueur. I forgot to take it last time. Give you two. Give you the, give the two you have there. The second one is raspberry. The wild strawberry one is gone. Well, I'll take it then. You know what? Better hand me all the alcohol if you're going to close up shop anyway. And some smoked sausage, too. All the alcohol? Yes, and half a bar of smoked sausage. A curly-headed young man rides a bicycle through town, through the town of Lon- Lodu in Lemminkainen. In the immediate entropenetic disaster zone, dusty bottles jingle in the trailer mixed with boxes of cigarettes and half a bar of doctor's smoked sausage, wrapped in paper. On the village road, the street lamps shine like diamonds in the morning darkness. That's all just very grim and... I guess we'll see where it goes. Yeah. But uh, I think I'm going to call it here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good good moment to stop. Oof. A little bit tamer ending than what happened in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know. And learning about, like, the main characters as well a little yeah, bit Yeah, I was going to say, I think I think a nuclear bomb in, in terms of main character revelations mm-hmm. is... is, is uh, the bigger deal uh, this time around. Mm-hmm. Knowing that, like, Khan was suffering in his youth and, like, growing up, he's dealing with this. Teresh is basically sacrificing his own sanity and mind, going f- inside, like, the mind of these criminals, these absolutely horrible, horrendous people, and losing himself a bit. And now we have Jesper, who, um, yeah. Yeah, might have been twisted by the the girl's stories in a particular way where it still carries on into his adulthood. It that's that's the feeling, right? Yeah. It feels as if like like yeah, if you're talking about how they process, that is one where you get stunted development perhaps. Yeah. You know, into whatever the fuck that turns into and um that's that's probably that's the same reading i got on it as well yeah um yeah yeah not great Hmm. pretty fucking horrendous um and uh 
I guess we'll see from there. Yeah. I guess the the one of the main things I'm curious about there is like they know about it. Um, they and it being the other the other two the other two did they Teresh know? and Khan. I don't think of, they. Well, I don't know if they knew about that tendency. But, but when they went to the spot, they were like, oh, up. we didn't know that you were dating this model. But then it cuts to a few days back. And then... Yeah, yeah. That's when it cuts back to them mm-hmm. a few days back. And they're like, oh, we didn't know you were dating her. Oh, yeah. Boobies, boobies, boobies. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So so did they learn about that at that moment? Or did they already know about that predisposition beforehand? Well, That they, we don't have the information, were, right? I, that is to say, I feel like that scene was kind of getting at like they were surprised that to, to that this person showed up and that you know like they're yeah. they're surprised at the entire exchange there yeah but like i mean is it immediately obvious like well anyway like they met four years ago and she's 19 and yeah so yeah yeah yes we met her at f- when she was 15 mm-hmm. and then at age 19 they learned about that yeah and they're like, oh, you're dating this person who's the sister of a famous person. Why didn't you tell us before? But they don't but didn't know really happen, yeah. when they met. Exactly. Right. 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 Okay. They don't have the history on yeah. that First time meeting being her. the case. You're, you're correct. That's true. That's what I was trying to piece together on the timeline yeah. there. <sighs> All right. Good session. good (laughs) uh what's going on what's going on i'm thinking about what we just read yeah (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. i mean like okay yeah so so Uh, yeah like like to to further to further reflect i think like because i do have yeah i do have more to say come to think of it like um I think we know what the sacred and terrible air is, right? Quite frankly, yeah. I think it's more than just air. It's the pail and the pail is rolling through yeah. ripping shit apart. And even um, at the end, the guy's like, Oh, you want this? Yeah. We're not importing any goods anymore. Yeah. Like, Oh, you want this? Pale aged okay. wine. Hurry up. Yeah. Right. And, um, and also the news, that they heard on the radio when he was like, "Yeah, Revachol is no more." And but the- but was that real? It wasn't re- that. But that's the thing. Like the way, like that that bit about Revachol. He, he it was like it said I was a lie. It was a lie. But then they listened to the radio, and then yeah. there was still news coming in. So why am was I, the? Am I misremembering? But was Revachol like a weird experiment, and the world, rest of the world didn't like? Like, wasn't there like an idea of like the rest of the world wouldn't allow Revachol to be what it is, and then there was like interventionism at some point so there was multiple things that happened in the timeline that i can recall that that could have been uh, applicable here revachal was cut off and there was the like the communism nuke the fall the, the fallout that happened after they tried to maintain the factory yeah there were disasters like that there was of course the the moral intern like rolling through after the war and taking over as well yeah. which was a pretty catastrophic event and then um, I mean, those are the three big ones I can think of in the timeline we learn about in Disco. So, like, um, that is totally possible. But what I'm unsure of, I guess, is like the way this sto- the way it was introduced, it made it seem like he was just gonna lie about some fucked up shit to like make her get her, to make her stay. Yeah, and then they listened and then the radio confirmed it and there was information and all that was happening so it's reality is confirming it but it still framed it in its in the way it was written as if he was lying about that so um i don't know if it was a matter of like he was i don't like you know what i mean like i don't know why it was discussed as brought up as a lie if the pale or if if it really happened or maybe there's an aspect to it where like 
he it, it's an elaborate ruse that he can somehow cause that moment to occur or maybe it's really oh, just happening and it's yeah, not a lie at all yeah maybe but, he was like oh it's 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 a lie that river shows no more but shit is still going down you know it could be yeah. right like maybe maybe there is something to like something's happening but it's not that and then he's making her panic about that to further entrap her in yeah. the locker and, you which know. is messed up so we don't have enough information right now but it definitely made it sound like he lied about that while things were being reported on the radio um that they listened to mm -hmm. right and her sister was there and her sister was there yes exactly um still fucking just ugh, mm. you know like your little yeah you got multiple main characters and it's like here's what's going on with one of them and then it's also like and here's how fucked up you know as well um so yeah uh but it, but it is it is definitely like if this is taking place well regardless of when or how it relates and such it is it is possible that like you know revishal is is cut off at this point because we do know that you know at least in the setting they they when you're talking to i think it was the pale rider and to um old lady um who explains this the world to you in disco oh um jay uh jo joyce joyce yes. yeah joyce I, Messier. I, I feel like those conversations establish that like you can't really make it elsewhere from here mm -hmm. you know so yeah and it was hard for her to cross the pale and yeah mm -hmm. yeah <sighs> i don't know did you yeah i was like I, i'm like we we all read it together right um so it's but it, it does seem unclear right i don't i don't i don't know if there's anything i missed there but yeah perhaps we'll we'll, we'll find out hopefully on oh, the freaking the creepiness yeah of the lin linoleum dr. salesman Lino dr linoleum salesman mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean you know with any type of story of of, of this nature it's like the, yeah you're gonna reveal how it went down at some point and like as you're getting to that it's just like and even that like discarded line of like what he did with them and stuff too you know it's 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 yeah it's just it's all fucking gruesome and then you're almost like it almost feels like you're like submerged in this like horrendous setting for those moments. And then like every time it cuts to shivers, it's almost like a breath of fresh air mm -hmm. to just be like, yeah, you know what? Let's talk about like the ground and the trees and the sky for a bit because yeah. what's happening amongst the people is just fucking horrendous, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. Well, in any case. Um, there was also the, uh, oh, shivers in 22 years, the first shot will be fired, not from a gun, an atomic device that will level all of me, all of me. It's during one of your blackouts in the game. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, that was, I want to mention there's that. a hidden godly reaction speed check when you're talking with them, dancing in the church, shivers. Uh, says the city will get nuked in 22 years without Harry's intervention, which is the time frame the book takes place on. I see. Okay, okay. Fuck. Yeah, one last thing. Wasn't there like a moment where they said like, I think it was Derek Trentmoller saying that the linoleum salesman um merged yes the girls together that's what i was talking about yeah. when, when, when it referred to what he did to them yeah yeah it was a very quick line it was so short it was so short so brief and then we it just, was so short that like it happened and you were reading and i was like wait a minute and i went i looked up and i read it again and i was like and it just went right past that yep <sighs> like <sighs> fuck yeah the most horrible, like just yeah, um, um, it, it, it just like and then, uh, uh, human centipede. Anyway, moving on. Yeah, you know, um, the 
uh, and then the the only the only other bit too was there was the um, seems to be an entire section where um, the 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 spirit of the innocence like is talking to you first person yeah right and I mean it's 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 hard to say if it's the spirit of the innocence or if it's the spirit of like the pale itself because it sounds like it's like I'm responsible for all these things but I am also destroying all these things and it's like the memories of all these moments and all these events events occurring so it could just be literally the pale talking but um it took on the um it took on the 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 embodiment of multiple innocences in that in that description so um yeah that was interesting too to hear that first person as well um I, yeah i got I, we'll see we'll see what answers we get but like it was all it was all horrible except for let's go fi- let's go yeah let's go shivers over here mm-hmm. let's go here you know what i mean like let's just go hear about out, out, other contexts otherwise yeah anyways um yes sir go sleep on that or not <laughs> stay awake okay <laughs>